Or at least I'm I'm trying. Uh oh, y'all give me a minute. I I didn't get this thing set up. There's too many things to do. I guess everybody that does anything with computers knows if you don't do it exactly the way they say do it, then it won't work. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I see you're ready. You're always ready, huh? Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kedishanu B'mesvatah V'tzivanu L'shmo'ako Shofar Blessed are you, Yahweh Eloheinu, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us by His commandments and commanded us to hear and respond to the call of the Shofar. Young people got a lot of breath. <laughs> we probably would too, but we've destroyed it with all the things that we've done over the years, you know, and, and not doing what we're supposed to do. The Father has become before you this day on your Shabbat. We ask for your wisdom and your guidance as we study and read your word in order to learn, in order to do. We look forward, Father, to the day that you bring us home, bring us back to the promised land, bring us into the fold. Help us that the words that we speak will be your words. The truth that we give would be your truth. Help us, Father, always to listen for what your word says and not be tossed about by winds of doctrine of others. Guide us always in your truth. B'Shem Yehoshua. Amen. Amen. The readings for today are going to be, we're going to be starting in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 21, and we'll be reading through chapter 7 and verse 89. Now, as we get into this, this uh, chapter 7, there's an awful lot of uh, repetition uh, that it goes over, and we might not do all of that. depends on how much time I take between here and getting there, okay? The, uh, we're going to be reading the half Torah today, but we're going to be reading in Judges chapter 13, uh, verse 2 through 25. One of the connections, you know, we, we talk about the half Torah that, you know, the word half Torah doesn't mean half of the Torah. The word Hathor means a concluding reading. And generally the prophets was a concluding reading. And, and we can talk about how, the, if anybody doesn't know how that came about, we can talk about it. And then we're going to be reading in Acts chapter 25 as we continue our study through the book of Acts. Starting chapter 25, beginning in verse 21. And I didn't write down a starting or a stopping point because I don't know how far we'll get into that. Depends on, you know, mind will absorb, you know, what the derriere will endure. So... But uh, the name of the reading today is called Naso. If you're in the Hebrew Bible or, or reading in the Pentateuch, Naso. The number is 5375, but it means to lift up or to count. Naso is like to lift up. And what they would do, they would lift up by the head of the hair, and they're counting heads is what they're really talking about. And that's where we got our phrase in the poll tax, which is where all this stuff comes from, and counting heads is what it's all about. But uh, last week as we were reading in Numbers, in, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, and, and we saw the appointment of, of, the, of, the, of the tribe of Kohah to their service and duties, which was to carry the furniture of the tabernacle. Next up here now, we're talking about the, the tribe the, the Gershon and then Merari, and then we'll have the three sons of, of Levi, or Levi complete. Aaron and Moshe were of Kohath and, and that descendant. Some of the major doctrines that we'll be looking at today and also in, in the book of Numbers as, as a whole, generally, uh, the census, of course, of the Levites. Uh, it's the separation of the lepers from the camp. You have a separation of people from the camp. The main reason is so that whatever they have that might be contagious does not take a chance on contaminating or destroying the whole camp. Okay, 
And all kinds of things are contagious among people. Some of it's disease, some of it's bugs, some of it's viruses, some of it's just words that we say, some of it's ideas that we have. All these things can be contagious. Then we get into the confession of sin and restitution. And then the ordeal of the wife suspected of infidelity. We'll get into that as we look at it today. And then, of course, the Nazarite vows. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just a concept. Setting apart through. You see what I'm saying? Setting apart. You remember the word holy means to set apart, or to sanctify, or to set apart, to make holy. The word holy there. So we're being sanctified or set apart through these Nazarite vows is what this is for. And then we'll also cover the Aaronic blessing today in, in Numbers. And we'll be looking then at the donations of the leaders of Israel and, and talk a little bit about the repetition of what they're giving and how it goes, you know, each time it goes over the same thing, you know, verse after verse after verse saying the same thing. And then when we get into the book of Judges, it's the story of the prophecy of the consecration and birth of Shimshon. And remember, Shimshon is the Hebrew name for Samson, Shimshon, which really means sunlight. And uh, uh, normally you'd be reading 1 Samuel, but that's in connection with the new moon, which we saw you know, here a week or so ago. <clears throat> and let me just say one thing, and especially to, to some of the new ones that are here, and, and I know that there are some new people here. Some been here one time, some been here two times, some been here three times, the rest of us are old hats, but... <coughs> There's a lot of things that happens in a group like this. Uh, we are Yeshiva Hanatev, okay? The board of directors of Yeshiva Hanatev had to be established because in the state of Texas, the law says you've got to do it, so you have to establish it. And you have to have a minimum of three directors on your board of directors, so the three directors of the board of Yeshiva Hanatev is myself, my wife, and Miss Dinah Stripling. What we teach, or what I teach, <laughs> We have to settle it between the three of us before I can teach it, okay? Because if I try to teach something that we haven't discussed, they get on my case real fast, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so understand then that we try. But now there's a lot of times, you know, and we don't have membership, right? We're not a church. We're not trying to be a synagogue. We're just a place, a house of study. It's a place where people can come to learn to study. And what I'm really interested in more than anything else is people learning how to study the Word. And I don't want people to, to hear something that I say and go home and believe it or tell somebody else that it's true because Dennis said it because that don't mean squat. It's only what you know from studying the Word of Yahweh yourself that makes a difference. If it doesn't come directly from Him, then everything you've got is strictly hearsay. And even in man's court of law, hearsay is not worth anything. It's only what you know between you and, and, and the Creator. With that being said, there's also things that happen in a group like this sometimes where people talk and this one says one thing to somebody and this one says one thing to somebody and the next thing you know it, somebody thinks, well, we must be teaching that and that may not be true. If you get something from something that somebody else says or an inkling or an idea or even a flat-out statement, and if you want to know that that's what we teach, you come ask us or whether we teach that or not because in a lot of cases it's not what we teach. We can't control what people do. I mean, that's hard enough for us to control one another, you know, so we're really not trying to control what anybody else does. The only thing that's supposed to control you is your obedience to Yahweh's Word. And Yahweh's Word will have an effect on everybody. Whether you obey it or disobey it, there will be an effect in your life based on what you do. So with that said, <laughs> you know, I'm just <clears throat> laying the groundwork here. Uh, as we get into it now in, in, in the book of Bamidbar, or Numbers, chapter 4 and verse 21. Then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Also take a census, a naso, lifting up or accounting of the heads, of the sons of Gershom by their father's house, by their families, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old you shall number them, all who enter to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. The name uh, 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 Gershon is 1648. And remember, in, in, uh, Gershon was the first child, uh, Kohath was the second son, and Merari was th the third son, or number three. So Gershon, the number 1648, if you want to look it up, and the name itself actually means exile. Kind of an interesting thought, exile. You know, remember the house of Israel, you know, I mean, the, the house of Levi, the, the tribe are scattered throughout all the, the tribes of, of the land. It means exile. It means a refugee. 
Now Moses' son was called Gershom. Gershom with a mim. We're studying Gershon with a noon, or the end sound as opposed to the end sound at the end of the word. The number wise, Gershom is 1647, which was the son of Moses, and that name means a foreigner. I mean, he was a foreigner, you know, he was born a foreigner in a foreign land, you know, down, down in Egypt, or, or in Midian. <clears throat> Gershon here is 1648, which means exile or a refugee. And then Merari, 4847, and the word Merari comes from Maror, which means bitter. It's the same root word as the bitter herbs, you know, that you do at Passover, Merari. It comes from 4843 Maror. And Kohath, being the second son, is a number 6955. And it means to ally oneself, or to become allied with, or to associate, or to become an assembly, depending on how many are involved in this thing. Now that's what these names mean. Later on, I think you'll see the, the importance of the names. If you haven't been into a study of meanings of the names, you know, and what they say and everything, remember there's a whole lot of stories being told just in the names. <clears throat> in uh, In that verse 23, you know, it says, From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, you shall number them. And then it says, All who enter to perform the service, to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. Now, I'm, I want to look at a few verses here in, 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 the, in the New Testament in regard to the, the commentaries. <clears throat> That wasn't mine. <laughs> okay. uh, I really can't hear them things most of the time, but when it gets so quiet, then I can hear all kinds of stuff. But <clears throat> if they were entering the service, entering to perform the work, <clears throat> and it was in the tabernacle of meeting, right? And if the tabernacle was built on the pattern of Yehoshua, you remember Yahweh, you know, said, I showed Moses the, the pattern and he built everything. And when we look at the tabernacle, we look at all the things in the service of the tabernacle, it's supposed to be our walk, our, our, our walk with Yehoshua. And if he's in us and if we're in him, and if we're seeing him in this tabernacle, then the service that they were performing is teaching us of how we're going to live with Messiah Yehoshua, right? Or how he's supposed to be in us or what we're supposed to represent. They were supposed to see Messiah in everything. Or Messiah himself said, when you, you, know, you study the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. He said, yet that's what talked about him. But he said, yet here I am and you don't receive me. right? And then he said, if you'd known the Father, you'd know me. But they didn't know the Father, so they didn't know him when he came. The question today is, most people don't know the Father and they don't know the Son either. And what they're accepting is somebody who's teaching false doctrines, which really winds up being something, accepting something that's false. So how can you know the true? And that's only by understanding and knowing what this word says. This word, alive in you, is the only thing that brings you truth. Okay? Again, all who enter to perform the service, to do the work, is what this whole thing is, is, is starts on here in verse 23. So go to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> You remember when I say New Testament and I call it commentary, I'm not saying it's not inspired. Please don't misunderstand me. But I want us to understand that what we call New Testament is really commentary on the Torah and the fulfillment of that which was prophesied. That's what Messiah said he came to do. I came to fulfill that which was prophesied of him. He came to complete it, okay? And then we have all the letters, you know, the Gospels and the letters of Paul and other people that are writing commentary on what Messiah did in filling what he was prophesied to do coming from the Torah. So we get an idea of what Torah says and understanding it by accepting him and what he said and what he did. In Romans chapter 9, hmm, I want to go to verse 4, but I was in chapter 4. <laughs> in this chapter 9 here, in, in verse 4, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, writes, Who are Israelites? Now that's kind of starting in the middle of the sentence, isn't it? So we're back up to the beginning of verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from the Mashiach for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. He was born, what, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
I know there's a lot of people that think that Benjamin actually was part of Judah. It wasn't part of Israel. But Yahweh said that as far as the kingdom was concerned, Benjamin was part of the northern kingdom of Israel. doesn't matter that Benjamin and those people decided to come down and join Judah in Yahweh's mind and in his word. He said Benjamin was part of the northern kingdom of Israel. So that's why Paul said he was an Israelite. To whom, and the word pertain is actually entered into the text by the translator. It's not actually in the text. But to whom pertain or belong the adoption? Then you have to go back, you know, into Genesis and find out what, what Jacob did, you know, by adopting, you know, Manasseh and Ephraim and all her descendants into. And he said, these two shall be like who? Reuben, Reuben and Simeon, Simeon, first and second born. You say Manasseh and Ephraim, then are going to be just like the first and second born to me. So the adoption belonged to who? The Israelites, all those who descended from them also. The glory, the covenants, the giving of the Torah, the service, and the promises. Who are all these things given to? The Israelites, right? And then, you know, last week we were studying Ruth. You know, she joined with them, right? And she became one. And she said, your people shall be my people, your creator, my creator. And she took upon herself the people and their covenant. We do the same thing and we have to come into that family or we don't have a kinsman redeemer, right? Okay. Go, go to Romans 12 in verse 1 and 2. Now he goes on explaining to here what our service is. You know, in Messiah Yehoshua, we walk according to the Torah, not to get our salvation, but because the Torah teaches us how to live as a new creature in the Messiah Yehoshua. If this word is the word made flesh, then we walk according to that word and it teaches us how to live as that new creature in him. In chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Yahweh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy or set apart, acceptable to Yahweh, your reasonable service. So again, we have service, you know, that we're supposed to be doing. If everything in the Torah and the service of the people in the tabernacle, you know, was to teach them about the Messiah, then they'd be learning about the Messiah the same as we are. And we're learning who and what he is by following the same instruction that Yahweh gave them. Verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Yahweh. What is his will for all of us? To walk in obedience to his word. To know the Son. To know the Father. <clears throat> Go to Acts chapter 26. <clears throat> we'll probably get over there again today, this afternoon. In Acts chapter 26, <clears throat> everybody's read these verses, and, and, but I, I just want to try to emphasize a little bit of it as, as we go through it to help us get a little more clear in our mind in verses 15 through 20 of, of Acts chapter 26. Now this is where, you know, uh, Yehoshua had appeared to Paul in the light and so forth, and he heard this voice. And in verse 15, he says, So I said, Who are you? You know, And he probably said, Adonai, or Master, or you know, who are you? And he said, Ani Yehoshua. Now later on, we're told by Paul that when, when he spoke to him on the road, he spoke to him in the Hebrew tongue. So if these are the words that he spoke, that he would have spoken in the Hebrew tongue, not Greek or Latin or something else. He said, I am... Yehoshua, Ani Yehoshua, whom you are persecuting. Remember, he was out there trying to kill the people. Messiah so said, if you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Verse 16, But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Then he says, I will deliver. Not, you know, you go back to the Hebrew, not saw, statue away from the Jewish people is implied. The actual Jewish word there is not in the text, but it's implied. As well as from the nations to whom I now send you. And you're sending Paul out to all the nations. Why did he go to all the nations of the world? Because the house of Israel is scattered among those nations of the world. Messiah said, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when he sent him out, all the Gentile nations of the world is to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Anybody can come in and be saved and do the same thing and become part of the family. 
verse 18, he said, to open their eyes, I'll deliver you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes and to turn from darkness to light. And the power of Hasatan, the adversary, to Yahweh, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified or set apart by faith in me. If we can ever get a hold of the word, you know, the meaning sanctified or holy, it's a real simple thing. It just means set apart for Him. Not any more complicated than that. And, you know, you don't have to have a degree in 14 different religions or anything else to understand the word holy means set apart for Yahweh's use. That's <laughs> all it is. And in verse 19, it says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent. Do we ever understand really what the word repent means? It means from turning you know, away from doing what you're doing turn back in obedience to what Yahweh said do. What the word always meant. Today though, most people don't have any idea what sin is. Is it transgression of the Torah? Yes, it is. If you don't understand what sin is, then you don't know what you're supposed to turn away from and turn back to. How do you repent? Unless you know what it is you're supposed to repent. But here he is talking about going to the Gentiles and to the Yehudi, all of the house of Israel. They need to repent and turn back in obedience to Yahweh's word. Make it even who you are. Isn't that what he's saying? <laughs> and do works befitting repentance. If people are doing things different from what Scripture says, then they really haven't repented, have they? In order to do works befitting repentance means that the works you do are in line with what the Torah says, then that shows that you are doing works that are what befitting of repentance. I don't think that's a real hard concept to get a hold of. Now we can cover it up with a lot of other doctrines and, and, and you know, the, theological or theological, theological, what, whatever the word is, you can cover them up with all kinds of stuff, but it doesn't mean anything. Go to Titus chapter 1. <clears throat> in, uh, in, in chapter 1 of Titus, in verse 16. I think this is very, very interesting because this is one of them things, you know, that so many people like to talk to. Well, this only applies to the, to the Gentiles or to the Christians or to somebody, you know. But in verse 16, he's talking about people. He said, they profess to know Elohim, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. If you haven't done this, just you know, pick up a Webster's Dictionary, okay, and go to the word deny, and look up the first definition of the word deny in Webster, and it'll say contradict. Matthew five seventeen, Messiah said, "Don't even think that I came to do away with the law of the prophets. I did not come to do away with the law of the prophets." And people keep saying, "Oh yeah, he came to do away with it." Isn't that contradicting him? Isn't that denying him? Now, we've been taught that deny really means to deny him as our Savior. Oh, well, I want him as my Savior, but he ain't going to run my life. Isn't that what they're people say? <laughs> that's what they think. Yeah. yeah, that's what they're saying without realizing that's what they're saying. But, yeah, it's, it, you know. Oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll let him save me, but he ain't going to tell me what to do. Then who in your mind is your real God that is not created the universe? Right? <clears throat> they profess to know Elohim, but in works they deny or contradict Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. That word disobedient, I wonder what it is that they thought they were supposed to be obedient to. Throughout the Scripture, the word repent means to turn back in obedience to the Torah. Right? Isn't that what Yahweh gave us as instructions to live by? And when people are sinning, that's known as what? Transgression of the law. That's sin, right? If you sin, you have to confess it, and then you what? Turn back and obedient to His Word. Go to Revelation chapter 2. 
The only thing I'm trying to show by going through these different things, you know, as we go through this thing, is that what started in Torah still exists in Revelation. <laughs> Yahweh said that He created everything in the world by His Word, did He not? Well, if everything else is going to be destroyed and the only thing that's going to still be there is His Word, then that means that His Word is what's eternal. Is that right? And Messiah said that the Word I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So if they are spirit and they are life, then the Word living in you gives you His Spirit, His life, and eternal life because His Word is eternal. But if that Word doesn't live in you, then what you got? You got what somebody else thinks. That's why we need to be so careful of doctrines of people, of other men. It's Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> Boy, I'm trying to pick out one little verse because there's so much good stuff in there. But in verse 26, after he'd made some promises, and he says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works, if you look it up in the Greek, the word there translated Greek for works means works. <laughs> it's not a hidden meaning. It means what it says in this passage. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Are we expected then to keep his works? What are his works? If there's not even, if people say, well, the Torah, the law, is not what we're supposed to do, then show me something else that he gave us to do. What is it? Where is it? If the law is done away with and it's no longer for today, then our question is, what is the new definition of sin? What is it? And the things that I'm saying right now are things that we come in contact with with people every day. And it doesn't make any difference. On a job, 20 years. You know, same people, 20 years. Same question. Well, we don't have to do that old law. Well, it's been changed, been done away with. Show me one verse that says that. Just, you know. Why are people so adamant about the doctrines that they have been brought up to believe? Because after all, nobody in this country would lie to us, would they? <laughs> I said that tongue-in-cheek, you understand, right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so go back now and let's look again at verse 23. All I'm trying to point out and, try, and, and get people to understand is what Yahweh is showing these people and what they're supposed to do here. Verse 23 of Numbers 4, From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, you shall number them all who enter to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. Tabernacle of meeting. Remember, the tabernacle itself had two rooms in it, one, right? One one was a room of fellowship or association. You go into fellowship. Or, or to socialize, or to eat with, have communion with, sharing with, not communion as we think communion, but, but sharing. And the other room is the presence of Yahweh. And you don't go to that one without going through the front room. Right? So we must come in and have partnership or fellowship. Remember when Paul said they extended to me the right hand of fellowship. Fellowship means partnership. Fellowship don't mean socializing like a dance. Fellowship is partnership. They extended the right hand to Paul. Partnership in teaching the word, the true word. That's what it's all about. And then in verse 24, <clears throat> said, This is the service of the families of the Gershonites in serving and carrying. They shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle and the tabernacle of meeting, its covering. The covering of, I know a lot of Bibles have the word badger and, and, and a lot of others have different words in there. The Hebrew word there that, that's been translated badger is the word takash. In the Hebrew, the number is 8476. Takash. Uh, it's really funny if you look that up in Strong, it'll tell you that it's probably the skin of some type of clean animal, like an antelope or something. And then in the translation, the rendering they give you is the word badger. <laughs> I've always been understood why they give you a definition of the skin of a clean animal but then they give you the word badger which is not exactly a clean animal I mean did anybody look at those things besides me <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting well we had man we sent a letter to Israel and we wanted to know what this word takash really meant because there's so many different things that it could mean and we got an answer back from Israel and the zoological society and everything over there and they said that this is definitely the word dugong so the animal that's in reference to is a dugong. 
the closest thing that we have here in this country would be known as a, a, a manatee. manatee. These things that down in the, in the shallow waters around Florida that live in the waters, you know, they, they're great big, you know. They're a mammal. And that's where this word dugong. Now, years and years and years ago, these things lived in the Red Sea and a lot of those places around over there, and they were known by, by, the, by the common term of Stella or Stellar Sea Cow. Okay? If you go back now and you look at some of these things where it talks about the vision of the man had where he saw these, these cows came up out of the water and it fed in the marsh grass along the edge. I'm wondering if these are cow-cow, like, you know, Holsteins, <laughs> or if it was talking about these cows, you know, referring to these dugong type things, which were known as sea cows. And I'm not trying to put out a doctor. I'm just trying to say things sometimes aren't always exactly the way they seem based on our English words. There's other things that they could be, and we need to study them deeper. Anyway, that's the word dugong or takash. And if you start thinking about it, a manatee or a dugong is an animal that what, has no reputation. He has no enemies whatsoever other than men. <laughs> they just live a quiet life, doing, you know, and, and, and yet their only enemy, like I say, is, is mankind. Messiah made himself of no reputation, didn't he? <laughs> There's nothing on the outside, it said, that would make us want him or to know him, right? So all the beauty and the glory was where on the inside. And when Yahweh starts changing us, where does He start? Inside. He really don't care what the outside looked like. Praise Yahweh. <laughs> Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so, it's, you know, the, the covering of the dugong skin that is on it, the screen for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the gate of the court, the hangings of the court, which are around the tabernacle of the altar and their cords, all the furnishings for their service and all that is made for these things, so shall they serve. So they're given the act of, of carrying, you know, all these things. If you stop and think about it, all everything in the tabernacle was broken up into three parts, and the three families were designed of the Levites then, and their whole purpose was to carry and lift up the things of Yahweh, Yehoshua, and they were to present them to the rest of the tribes, right? So we're going to become part of if you take a Nazarite vow and become part of these people, or if you were, you know, your whole job then is to what? To lift up Messiah to the other people. What did Messiah say when he was talking about going to the execution stake? What did he say? If I be lifted up, he said, I will draw all men to myself. If he is the word, then how can we go wrong lifting up the word and trying to show who he is in that? Now whose job is it to draw all men to him? It's his job. Our job is to lift up the word, lift up who he is. <clears throat> In verse 27, it says, Aaron and his sons shall assign all the service of the sons of the Gershonites, all their task and all their service, and you shall appoint to them all their task as their duty. This is the service of the families of the sons of Gershon in the tabernacle of meeting, and their duties be under the hand of Itamar, the son of Aaron the priest. It's interesting too, Itamar, the number is 385, for the, for the, if you want to look it up in Strong. Remember when the Strong Concordance is not, not the ultimate definition of what a word, but I understand it. You go through, you know, you've got a brown driver, brig, go back to just seeing these, you know, you go back to the original Hebrew, and that's what we're really trying to find is the etymological meaning from the Hebrew of what this meant when they wrote it. But here the best I can see is that word Itamar means the coast of palms. Or an area of palm tree. And I think it's interesting because when Solomon actually built the temple and he, you know, lined the inside of the temple with cedar, what did he carve into it? Called palm, palm trees, right? And then he, what, he overlaid them with gold. And then when we look at the tabernacle, everything was made out of wood. I'm not trying to say cedar, but it was made out of wood and covered with gold, right? And the gold represents the divinity of Yahweh. Unless we are covered with Him, Right? We have no righteousness or, or divinity of our own. Is that true? So you might say then that the trees and the wood and the uprightness represents you know, the uprightness of Messiah as a man. And then he came and, and cleansed us so that we can become the righteousness you know, in, 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 through him. <clears throat> anyway. So Aaron and his sons assign all the task. Okay. <clears throat> Moses is to assign the task to Aaron and his sons as their duty. So Moses did that to them, and then they in turn assign the task to those under them. Everything comes down from what Moses said. And who was Moses? 
He was the lawgiver. Right? The lawgiver. <clears throat> and people can argue about where my personal opinion. Did you hear me say that? My personal opinion. You know, that and $5 will get you a cup of coffee in a lot of places. You know. But I think Yahweh chose every word that He told Moses to write down. There wasn't any, you know, there was a specific point in it. It wasn't just, you know, something abstract. Everything was there for a purpose. He assigned the task to Aaron and his sons as their duty. <clears throat> now that word duty in verse 27 is not actually in the Hebrew text. There's another word there, but it can be uh, interpreted to mean duty, and I think that that's what the translators have done. But he assigned everything, and it came from Moses. If we go with me to Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, that's one of the little books a lot of people don't read because most people can't say it. <laughs> Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> right in, in front of Song of Solomon and, and right behind Proverbs. In chapter 12. <clears throat> in verse 13. You know, in our uh, in our English language, sometimes you know you write down one or two Hebrew words, and it takes you know fourteen English words to try to teach or explain what everything is saying. When it's really so simple in Hebrew, you know, like it back in Genesis chapter one when Yahweh said, "Light be, light was," and then we go through a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, adding extra curriculum. But in Ecclesiastes twelve and in verse thirteen. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. W-H-O-L-E. It's the word kol in Hebrew. I don't know the number. I, I, didn't, I didn't write it down. But he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole, the whole matter. Fear Elohim and keep His commandments. For this is the whole. If you've got a Bible that's got the word duty in it, you can just put a line through it because it's not in the Hebrew text in that passage. For this is the whole, whole, whole of man. Not just your duty, but this is the whole of who you are. What were we created for? To glorify Him. You know, there's a lot of people that go out and children go out, you know, and, and they go out in the world and say, i got to go out and find myself. i got to go out and find my purpose. i got to go out and find what I'm supposed to do. The Bible says, Yahweh said, you were created to glorify Him. That's what we're supposed to do. Fear Elohim and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. For Elohim will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it's good or whether it's evil. So the whole of man is to do what? Obey Him. Period. That's the whole of our life. Through the obedience to that Word. Now remember, that Word is the Messiah in the flesh, right? That's the Word that became flesh. We call Him Yehoshua the Messiah. So if we follow that Word, since that Word is the Messiah, then we walk in obedience of that Word and then we are predestined through the obedience of that Word to become in the image of Messiah Yehoshua, right? We'll never replace Him. We can't do that. But we can be in the image of Him. We can be like Him, right? But if He is the Word and you do something different than what the Word says, how in the world are you going to be like Him? Then you're following something of somebody else. You're not following Him. Okay. <laughs> Going back to... <laughs> chapter 4 there, numbers in... in uh, yeah, well, we were studying that from verse 27, but in verse 28 it said, This is the service of the families of the sons of Gershon in the tabernacle of meeting, and their duty is under the hand of Ithamar, the son of our own priest. So everything was given as instructions and what they're supposed to do with administering the word. <clears throat> and what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to minister the word. The word will accomplish that which Yahweh sent it to do. Scripture says that his word is true because it will accomplish that which he sent it to do, right? Doesn't matter what we do, his word will accomplish what it's sent to do. 
<clears throat> so in verse 29, As for the sons of Merari, you shall number them by their families and by their father's house. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, you shall number them, everyone who enters the service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And this is what they must carry as all their service for the tabernacle of meeting. The boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the pillars around the court with their sockets, pegs and cords, with all their furnaces, all their service. And you shall assign by name, now most Bibles have the words to each man, as it, you know, implied, by name the items he must carry. I want you to realize how specifically it is the items were assigned by name to an individual on what they must carry. Nobody was in doubt as to what they were supposed to do. Things only become doubtful when people begin to distort what the things say. Bible not hard to understand if you make up your mind to believe it. Bible becomes hard to understand when you read it and that doesn't match what somebody else has been saying to you. Then when what they say and what you read, you know, doesn't mesh, and then the first thing people think is, well, you know, they've been to seminary, they got the degrees, they must know what they're talking about. And in reality, what their degree is in is in some particular denominational doctrine, not Scripture. There's a difference in teaching doctrines or teaching Scripture. <clears throat> Verse 33. <clears throat> this is the service of the families of the sons of Merari, as all their service for the tabernacle of meeting under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. If everything concerning the tabernacle was a picture of Messiah, then everything in the tabernacle was broken up into three parts, and these three parts were given to the three sons of Levi, these families, and then their whole job then was to lift and to carry everything pertaining to Messiah Hoshua, if the tabernacle is picture him. As we begin to study and learn what the people did in the tabernacle, what the priest did in the tabernacle, then we're beginning to learn what we're supposed to do in Messiah Hoshua or him in us. It's one and the same, is it not? But without understanding what this is, is how do you know what it's supposed to be? In verse 34. <clears throat> and Moshe, Aaron, and the leaders of the congregation numbered the sons of the Kohathites by their families and by their father's house. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, everyone who entered the service for work in the tabernacle of meeting, and those who were numbered by their families were 2,750. These were the ones who were numbered of the families of the Kohathites. All who might serve in the tabernacle of meeting, whom Moshe and Aaron numbered according to the commandment of Yahweh by the hand of Moses. And those who were numbered of the sons of Gershon by their families and by their father's house, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, everyone who entered the service for work in the tabernacle of meeting, those who were numbered by their families by their father's house were 2,630. These are the ones who were numbered of the families of the sons of Gershon, of all who might serve in the tabernacle of meeting, whom Moshe and Aaron numbered according to the commandment of Yahweh. How many times did he say these were numbered according to what they're supposed to do? Is this redundant, or is he making sure that we understand what their purpose is and what they're supposed to do? <laughs> as many times as he said it, we ought to get it. What was their job? To carry the stuff. <laughs> and then they were assigned what they were going to carry by Moses, by name, to what, you know, each one what it was. There was no doubt what they're supposed to do. This is only hard to understand when we start bringing in other things to try to compete with it. <laughs> okay? In verse 42, those were the families of the sons of Merari who were numbered by their families by their father's house from 30 years old and above even to 50 years old. What age are you supposed to be? 30 to 50. <laughs> now we're going to get to another place where it says you may enter at the age of 20. But at the age of 30 is when it's kind of like it's set up for that. What age was Messiah Hosher when he began to enter into his duties as a priest? He was about 30, right? Is what they thought. And then, you know, he went in and was baptized about 30, and then he went out and he fasted for 40 days, and he came out just in time for Yom Kippur. If that's true, that means he had a birthday in there, didn't he? It's Sukkot, and became 30. And then he began his ministry where? In Galilee. And what was the first thing that he did? What was the first sign that he did? Change the water to wine. And where was that? <laughs> in Cana of Galilee. And if you'll notice in the second chapter of the Gospel of John, it says, and on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Right? And the mother was there and all the disciples. 
And then we go back in, in Song of Solomon and we find that when Solomon, the king, Shalom of Peace, king of peace, he was crowned by whom? His mother. When? Where? At the wedding. <laughs> Messiah hadn't been crowned king yet, has he? But when he come back, he's wearing the crown and all the saints are with him. So somewhere or other, there was a coronation that occurred. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 42, Those are the families of the sons of Merari who were numbered by their family, by their father's house, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, everyone who entered the service for work in the tabernacle of meeting. Those who were numbered by their families were 3,200. These, the ones who were numbered to the families of the sons of Merari, whom Moshe and Aaron numbered according to the word of Yahweh by the hand of Moshe. All who were numbered of the Levites, or the Levites, whom Moshe, Aaron, the leaders of Israel, numbered by their families and by their father's houses. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, everyone who came to do the work of service and the work of bearing burdens in the tabernacle of meeting. Those who were numbered were 8,580. According to the commandment of Yahweh, they were numbered by the hand of Moshe, each according to his service and according to his task, Thus were they numbered by him as Yahweh commanded Moses. Is there any misunderstanding of what these people were numbered and identified to do? <laughs> it goes over to enough time. We ought to have an understanding, right? So whose job is it to lift up the name of Yahweh? Whose job is it to lift up Yahweh? I'm talking about now, and it was a Levi's job to carry all these things. <clears throat> Chapter 5. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel. Notice every time you see the word children in the, in the Hebrew, normally it's, it's vain, meaning the sons. The instructions were given to the sons because they're supposed to be the head of the house. It's one of the things that we've lost in our society today that the sons are supposed to be the spiritual head of the house. They're the ones that are supposed to control everything concerning the, you know, the spirit of the word. But our society has them out working for filthy lucre, so to speak, and leaving the wives and children at home, you know, to fend for themselves or let the wife become the head of the house spiritually, right? And they're not this. They're looking they're lift, for their job. And yet they're the ones that's supposed to be the spiritual head of the house. That's the birthright. That was what, you know, uh, uh, Jacob and Esau fought over, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. For the birthright. One coveted and the other despised it. <clears throat> okay. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a body. The word dead is, is in italics in most Bibles. The word body is in number 5315. And it's it referring to the nephesh of the breathing spirit. So everyone who is what? Contaminated by something who's dead. Doesn't say necessarily human or animal. could be either one. How can anybody be cold? I'm sweating. You shall put out both male and female. You shall put them outside the camp that they may not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. So putting them out is what? Keep them defiling the camp. If somebody did something wrong, they would be what? Killed or put out in order to get the evil out of the camp. Does Yahweh look for a camp which is pure and clean and walking in obedience to Him? Has that ever changed? And Yahweh is still looking for a people that will walk in obedience to Him, looking for people that are clean, that are pure. I say this because we can keep the Sabbath, and we can not eat pork chops, and we can keep the festivals, and we can do a lot of physical things, but sometimes in our dealing with one another, we can be nasty as a junkyard dog. We can really be mean, okay? And the thing about it is, most time we hear things like it, we always say, well, yeah, that's the other person because that ain't me. <laughs> How many times do we ever hear a thing like that that we apply them to ourselves and say, well, am I breaking Tory in that respect? Well, I'm keeping them over here, but what about over here? And sometimes the worst things that we can ever do is in our relationship with other people. And sometimes it's just at home. I mean, you know, <laughs> we can have problems. And unfortunately, you know, it's just like we have three sons and you don't see any of them here today. And, and what we raised our sons up to believe and everything, if I'd known when I was raising them, I would have taught them entirely different what I did. 
but we didn't. But we can only say now, hey, I'll teach you the truth now that I know better, and if you'll come, I'll be glad to give you what I've got. But it's come kind of, kind of strange when you get older, and you go back and you think about your children, and the only thing that you really have to offer them right now is the words of eternal life, and they don't want it, because what they're after is what you taught them they're supposed to seek after again. That's tough. We can't change that. We can repent of it, you know, and not ever teach that again. But we, but yeah, we, but now we still we're living with those things that we've done, right? And hopefully it'll change, and we keep praying for that. But I'm just trying for us to understand it's not just sometimes the physical things of keeping the Sabbath and not eating the pork and everything. It, there's a lot of other things involved in it, in relationships between people. The scriptures are teaching us that we have to have a relationship with the one that created us. Correct? We can only do that through His Word. Right? What we need to keep our eye on then is relationships and the other things will fall into place. We start out walking in obedience because keeping the Sabbath was something that well, we can see, touch, you know, we can do that. But then that leads us into other things. Because it's like it says in, in the book of Acts, you know, they go into the synagogues on the Sabbath day and then they're going to learn everything else through Moses and what he's taught, what he's, you know, what's being read, and then they'll learn to do the other things. Verse 4, And the children of Israel, the sons of Israel, did so and put them outside the camp as Yahweh spoke to Moshe. So the sons of Israel did. They're walking in obedience, you know, and this is this uncleanness, okay? <clears throat> in the uh, word camp, in uh, verse 1, oh, every, every place here, that word camp is the number 4264. I give you the strong number because nearly everything is based on the strong uh, numbering system, you know. But you can go back and look in Strong, or you can go back and look in Brown Driver Briggs, go back to your seniors, you can find all the way back in the lexicons. This number just helps you. I'm not trying to say that Strong is the only source, okay? But that's the numbers that sift. everybody's adopted. But the word camp, number 2583, it's the Hebrew word kona, and it actually means to pitch a tent. You're out of the place, you know, where you pitch the tent. It means out of where you're living. Okay. Let's just don't get the idea, oh, well, I didn't, I'm not living back there around that tabernacle. I'm not living outside, you know. I'm not, you know, it doesn't apply to me because I'm not living where they were. No, it's where you pitch a tent. It's where you live. Go to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 18, in verse 20. Now remember, back then these people were in the in the process of living the Torah. They were in the process of writing down the Torah. Yahweh was giving the word to Moshe. Moshe was writing it down. Moshe was instructing the people. The people, you know, the Levite, they were instructing other people. So they were in the process of living what we're reading about now. Okay? Forget a hold of that. Once this has been completed, all of it points to Messiah Yehoshua, then in Matthew 18, verse 20, Yehoshua said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, Ani, I am there, Ani Shema, in the midst of them. Now, if this is true, then if we gather together in the name of Yehoshua, if we are today, you know, gathered because studying the Word, studying the name, right? Then is He with us? If the Spirit and the Word are the same thing, is the Spirit and the Word with us as long as we have this Word? So wherever we are in His name, He is with us, right? Okay? Now, if I say Spirit and Word, same thing. Don't let people, I'm not... I'm not trying to say there's no spirit that, that you can be guided by or anything else, but I'm just saying the spirit that you hear is never going to tell you something different than what the Word says. This Word is the only thing we have to say. Remember, the Scripture says, test the spirits. A lot of people out there want to listen for something, but they don't ever go back to the Word and see what it says or how it checks or anything. But here he says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. <clears throat> and in verse 3, back over in, in, in Numbers 5, that word defiled in verse 3. 
put them outside the camp that they may not defile their camps or where they, you know, pitch a tent where they live. The word for defile, the number is 2930. It's the Hebrew word tome. It means to be foul or to be contaminated. <clears throat> you know, back during the, the history, if you go back to the plague in, in Europe and everything, you know, so many things happened. And, and because of the living habits and unclean and so forth, you know, and, and the rats and the plagues and people were dying, except most of the Jewish people weren't. And it was because of the, lo the, the rules and regulations, the laws and the cleanliness laws. So at that time, people began to think, well, since they weren't dying of it, they had to start it. They, were the, they created it, therefore we're going to kill him because they're the one to put it on us. And in reality, it was just their obedience to the word of Yahweh that saved them and kept them from those things. The word of Yahweh will perform in your life if you will do the work or work the word. If, you know, if, you, if you do what the word says do, then the word will perform in your life. Does the word say, I set before you this day blessings and cursings? You choose. Life and blessings, death and curses, you choose. It's the same. The word, the water, the word. We get the idea of the washing of the water, the word. We've heard that, right? We understand the word, the water represent one and the same. When Moshe brought the people through the Sea of Reeds or the Reed Sea or however you want to say it, the water stood up. The word stood up and formed a path through death. And they went through. And it was life to the one group. But what happened to those who were trying to come behind and kill them? Death. The same word was life to one and death to the other. The water. The washing of the water of the word. The same thing here. If we can ever really get a hold of that, and you can't go through and pick out and sort them out and say, oh, well, <coughs> I like this word, but I don't like that one. <laughs> it's all. All of this word. If you change the word, aren't you changing Messiah? If he's the word, you can't change one word, because if you do, then you're changing the Messiah you present to people. Paul, when he wrote, I have not, what well, he said, I haven't, what hell back, I've presented you the whole, well, I use the English word, the whole gospel, the whole good news of everything. All he's trying to do is go out here and teach people how here's what the word said was going to happen, and here's what the word became flesh, and he came and made it happen. <clears throat> okay. The word defiled, verse 3, Tome, to be foul or contaminated. If we go on down in, in verse <laughs> verse 5 of Numbers 5, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel when a man or woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against Yahweh, and that person is guilty. The word person is the number 5315. It's the same word that was translated body a while ago. You know, you, so I guess you could be dead or alive. If you're walking in obedience to Yahweh's word, you're alive. If you're not walking in obedience to Yahweh's word, then you're dead while you're walking. Talking about walking dead, that'd make a movie. <laughs> if he commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against Yahweh and that person is guilty, then he shall confess the sin which he has done. He shall make restitution for his trespass in full plus one-fifth of it and give it to the one he is wrong. One-fifth is the same as saying 20%, right? Pretty good penalty. <laughs> Word sin in verse 6 is the number 2403. The word uh, here is the word katot, katot being feminine plural of the word katal. But it's kata'a is the root word meaning an offense. Okay? And the root of this number 2403 is the number 2398, kata, and it means to miss. It means to miss the way. It means to miss the goal or the path to go wrong. I know a lot of people like to, to, to quote, you know, when they talk about sin in, in the Greek and everything, they say, well, it means to miss the mark. Well, yeah, it does, but the rest of that verse in the definition says to miss the mark and therefore not partake of the prize. <laughs> okay? But here is to miss, to miss the goal or to miss the path, to go wrong. And then the word unfaithfulness there, when they commit a sin in unfaithfulness, and that word unfaithfulness is the number 4604. It's the word ma'al, and it means treachery or an unfaithful act.
when they do this and that person is guilty, then he must confess the sin, right? Go to 1 John. In 1 John chapter 1, I'm going to have to get out that other Bible. <laughs> this one is getting kind of hard. <clears throat> Coming apart. In 1 John chapter 1, I want to start in verse 7 of 1 John 1 and read down through 10. It said, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Remember I was talking earlier about fellowship and partnership? He says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. If we're not walking in the light together, we don't have fellowship with one another. And one of us <laughs> doesn't have fellowship with Messiah. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of the host of Mashiach, His Son, cleanses or purges us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then evidently unrighteousness is sin. And obedience to the Torah is righteousness, so disobedience has got to be unrighteousness. But we have to know what it is and we have to confess it. If you don't know what sin is, how do you confess the sin in your life? And people can say, oh, well, I didn't know. Well, it's always been there. The Word is there. You can read the Word for yourself. You don't have to wait for somebody else to give you their interpretation of it. If you let the Scripture interpret itself, you won't have a problem with interpretation. It's when you start letting other people interpret that you get in trouble. Verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. We always like to think the problems we got is because of what somebody else did. <laughs> okay? Never what we did. And we sometimes have a, you know, we overlook our part in you know, whatever it was. Go to, go to 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 4 through 10. And remember, this is what's called the, the New Testament or the commentary. <clears throat> and you know, this book was written by this one, this 1 John, and he wrote number 2 and number 3. Just kidding. But in John, in 1 John 3, in, in verse 4, it says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. <clears throat> the word for lawlessness is the number 458. It's the word anomos. 3551 is a word in the New Testament translated law in every case, and it's the word nomos. When you put the a in front of it, it means against, or, or then it becomes 458. Anomos, or against, or, or transgression of the law word sin there is the number 266. And he's saying then that sin is transgression of the law, the Torah. If you look up the number 3551 for the law in the Greek, it will tell you a, a, a series of things that you're supposed to do, but then it also says specifically the volumes of Moses is what it says in the definition. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Verse 5, And you know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. Boy, that's a tough one. But remember, if we break the Torah somewhere, we confess our sin and repent and turn back, and then the sacrifice He made, you know, cleanses and washes it. And because of what Messiah Yehoshua has done, we can be forgiven and reconciled back to the Father. Doesn't the scripture say that the Father was in Yehoshua reconciling the world back to Himself? We've got to get an idea. We've got to know who He is. And then in verse 7, He said, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as He is righteous. If righteousness is obedience to the Torah, then you're not practicing righteousness if you're not practicing walking in obedience to the Torah. I mean, that's not, that's not a hard equation. Verse 8, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose. Uh oh. <sighs> Gotta turn it over. Mm. <clears throat> I 
again in verse 8. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Yahweh was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Or the adversary of hearts of time. The word that there is no name of what we call Satan anywhere in Scripture. The word Satan itself is not a name. I don't care how many people try to capitalize anything else. The just word means the adversary. Anything that is against the Scripture is against Yahweh. He is the Word. So anything that leads you to do something against what the Word says, you are following the dictates of Hasatan, or the adversary. Whether they call him devil, or, or Hasatan, or Lucifer, it doesn't matter what they say. Remember, Lucifer is not a name. It was a Latin word that means a light bearer, and they put a capital L on it when they put it in the English language, and it became the name of the, of the devil. But it never was intended to be a name in the first place. For this purpose, the Son of Yahweh was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil or the demons or anything that goes against Yahweh's word. Whoever has been born of Yahweh does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of Yahweh. In this, the children of Yahweh and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of Yahweh, nor is he who does not love his brother. Oh, boy, that's a tough one there. Hmm. And yet 99.9% .9 of the most of the trouble we have in our life is in our relationship. Not with the world out there, because they really don't care about you one way or the other. <laughs> but it's with somebody who normally claims to be a brother or a believer. I don't care what religion they are. You know, they could be in Judaism, or they could be in Islam, or they could be in anything else. But there's going to be a problem, there's going to be a conflict between the two because of what people believe. And yet most of the time, whoever's in this fight, none of them are walking in toward and all I like to say, well, I am, but it, you know, you're the one that's not. <laughs> and yet, if we really examine ourselves, we'll find out, hey, you know, we got too many things in our life we got to fix, but we always want to fix somebody else. You know, if each person gets himself right, everybody else is going to come together in unity. Did that happen? Your name I told. That's a good song. Okay. <clears throat> in. Uh, Going back to Numbers. In verse 7 there, the word restitution. He shall make restitution of the offense or of the problem, whatever it was. The number is 7725. If you were to pronounce it, it would be pronounced like S-H-O-O-V, shuv. Now, I'm not telling you that's how the word is spelled. I'm just saying those are the letters that I use to represent the sound of the word, you know. It means to repent also. The word restitution, it means to make recompense to. And that's what he says, make recompense plus one-fifth, plus 20% of whatever's wrong. You know, how are you going to do that? You're going to make restitution. <clears throat> now go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 in verse 17 <coughs> now remember a lot of time what I'm doing and what I'm teaching here and I'm showing people to look these things up I'm not trying to say that everybody else needs to do these kind of things but I'm saying that we if we're really trying to walk in obedience to Torah we're going to be faced all day long with people who are not trying to follow Torah but they think that what they're doing is, and they keep trying to tell you that, well, we don't have to do those kind of things. That stuff was for the Jews, not for us. You know, they got all kind of reasoning why what you say has no bearing on their life. And yet here in, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, Messiah, when he was speaking, I think if you really brought it out, he was speaking to anybody who'd hear. Right? And he says in that verse 17, from that time, Yehoshua began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has drawn near. And what does repent mean? It means to turn back in obedience to Yahweh's word. It does not mean to go back to the original starting point and start over. It means to turn back where you are right now, right this minute, and you repent and start walking in obedience from this point forward. We can't ever go back. You can't remove what's been done. But we can confess those things and start over and repent from this point forward. That's all he said. That's what he expects of us. And we can do that. 
Go to Luke chapter 13. In uh, verses 2 through 9. You know, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a, a Torah teacher. I consider myself, that's what I'm supposed to be teaching Torah. But at the same time, teaching Torah just to know what it says without having to being able to apply it in your life doesn't help either. And at the same time, the commentary that we have in the New Testament Gospels so is teaching the same thing that Torah's always been teaching. And here in chapter 13, you know, and it's in the red, but Messiah speaking, starting in verse, uh, verse 2. And Yehoshua answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? You see what they're talking about in verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled or mixed with their sacrifice. And he said, Do you suppose that these were worse than all others because they suffered such things? What makes the difference in our eyes of, of who's doing something worse than somebody else? Because of something that happened to them? I mean, that's exactly what those friends of Job said when he started having a problem. They said, well, you must be a sinner and you must have been doing something real bad or this stuff wouldn't happen. Isn't that what they were telling him? And a lot of times we judge other people and whether how they're walking and whether they're walking with the Torah by the good things or the bad things that happened to them. And you know that's based on what we think. <laughs> and at that point in time, we just became a judge of the Torah. Isn't that something? And if we're judging the Torah, then we're sure not walking in it. And if you're judging the Torah, and that's the word that became flesh, then you're really judging Messiah. That's a tough thought. We don't ever really equate. When, until we get to the point where we begin to realize this word is Messiah, Yehoshua, and it's real, and He's real, and you can't separate the two. And if you change one word, you just changed Him. That's a tough, that's a tough concept. I don't think many people are really looking at that concept. How many people have ever really decided I'm going to walk in obedience to this word because I'm going to be like Messiah Yehoshua? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. What does Paul say? Imitate me as I, the Messiah. So that's who he was imitating. And Paul was imitating Messiah. And yet all of the word, the Torah, is the Messiah. And he's in the flesh. How can you change the Torah without changing who Messiah is? Oh, I know. I didn't mean to preach. <clears throat> but more that's good stuff. <laughs> but he said uh, in verse 3, he said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's saying unless you repent, you're going to have the same problem. doesn't make any difference what the sin is, period. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Look at there. It's growing, but it's not bearing fruit, so it's just what? Using up the ground. But he answered and said to him, Sir, uh, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize. And if it bears fruit... Well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. You see, <clears throat> in agriculture, you dig around it, and you water it, and you fertilize it and everything, and then it's supposed to bring forth fruit, if it's a fruit tree or something. And if it doesn't, then what? It ain't going to. The Scripture tells us that we'll know one man, one another, by their fruits, right? What are their fruits? It's their walk, their active obedience to what Yahweh's Word says. That's what, you know, that's how we can know who is and who isn't in the family. And you know them by what they do. But the rational beings that we are, we can take anything and rationalize it right out of existence. I mean, we can make out like it didn't ever exist in the first place, can't we? And the thing about it is, the only people we can make believe it is us. <laughs> we, we make us and believe it, but you know, but nobody else does. They know. They know. So we're just, you know, you're kidding yourself. <clears throat> okay. Go back to verse 8 in Numbers 5. And then we're going to go to Leviticus here. But in verse 8 he said, But if the man has no kinsman, remember that's that word goel, or, or goel, or goal, 
I'm not going to get into a, a pronunciation fight with people on how they say things, okay? Because whether you're from up north, east, south, or west, they say it different. But the word itself, the goel, actually has two meanings. It can be the kinsman redeemer, or it could be the avenger of blood. And I think the difference on which one it is is determined by whether you're in the family or not. Okay? But if the man has no goel, no kinsman, to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, then the restitution for the wrong goes to Yahweh for the priest. Who does it go to? It goes to Yahweh for who? For the priest. In addition to the ram of the atonement with which atonement is made for him. <clears throat> just go to Leviticus, uh, go back to Leviticus chapter 5 for just a minute. And... Uh, Verses 15 through 19, Leviticus 5. <clears throat> Things in, in Exodus refer back to Genesis. Things in Leviticus refer back to Exodus. Things in Numbers go back to Leviticus. Things in Deuteronomy go back all the way through Genesis, okay? Everything refers back to something else. Until you know what came first and what it meant, then what you read that came later, you really don't understand until you know what was said to begin with. That's why people have so much trouble reading the, the, the New Testament commentary because they don't understand anything about Torah, so they get some kind of mixed up explanation of what the New Testament commentaries are talking about. And all they're trying to do is give you a commentary on the Messiah fulfilling what Torah said he was going to do. And it's really pretty simple. But if you don't understand Torah and the prophets and everything in the writings, then you really don't understand what Messiah did. Here in Leviticus 5, and starting in verse 15, it said, If a person commits a trespass and sin unintentionally in regard to the holy things of Yahweh, then he shall bring to Yahweh as his trespass offering a ram without blemish from the flocks with your valuation and shekels of silver, according to the shackle of the sanctuary as a trespass offering. And he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regard to the holy thing and shall add one-fifth to it and give it to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. If a person sins and commits any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of Yahweh, though he does not know, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity or his punishment. You know the word iniquity can mean sin or it can also mean the punishment for it. It can mean the same thing. And he shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish from the flock with your valuations of trespass offering so the priest shall make atonement for him regarding his ignorance in which he erred and did not know and it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against Yahweh. Even today in our society if somebody gets stopped by an officer of the law you know some kind of a, a traffic law and they said, well, officer, I didn't know. And they said, well, the ignorance of the law is no excuse. You're still going to get a ticket, right? You're going to pay for what you did. The thing about it is, you'll know it next time. <laughs> but that's when you repent. So I ain't going to do that some more. <laughs> you know? And yet when we bring the same thing home to us, if you're driving down the street and the, street, and the highway marker says 55 miles an hour, if you're doing 55, are you being legalistic or keeping the law? And if you're doing 65, then what do you do? <laughs> you're out from under the, the Torah because he said obey the laws of the land. So when you break the laws of the land, then you're breaking his word because he said keep them going. Isn't that a thought? I know I don't even talk to you about driving, right? Okay. Go back to Numbers but, but, and realize there <clears throat> that even there in verse 8, he's referring back to what was given before in Leviticus. We do the same thing when we read the commentary. He's referring to some of those things which were written back in the Torah, but if people don't know what the Torah said, then they don't have any idea what the New Testament commentary is talking about. <clears throat> uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Pentateuch or, or some of the Jewish writings and so forth and back in the town, but different things, but I'll just make a quote here. There was a Jewish writer called Bakya, B-A-C-H-Y-A, Bakya, and he wrote this statement. Any wrong which a man commits against his fellow is at the same time treason against Elohim. Unquote. Mm -hmm. If each one of us claim to be following Yahweh and he's living in us, 
when Simon spoke to Paul, he said, Why are you persecuting me? And what he said? If each one of us has Yahweh living in us, Yahushua living in us, right? Then we belong to him. If somebody comes against us, are they not enemies of Yahweh? We read these words. We talk about these things. We think about them. We go over it. We've done this. You know, we get going through the reading the Torah and the prophets year after year after year after year. And sometimes, you know, we say, well, I've heard all that before. Yeah, but did you ever really take it in to what it really means? I had somebody say to me one time, said, you know, when are you going to start teaching something new? Well, when you get this. <laughs> you know, when, when you get this, we'll go to something else. But what else is there in life if there is no obedience to Torah and the word of Yahweh? What is there? The only thing that you can say for sure that's certain if you're walking in disobedience is what? You're going to wake up someday to eternal what, damnation or whatever. There sure is a lot of difference between the eternal damnation or being the eternal life of Yehoshua. And what is the definition of eternal life? John 17. we got to read that because it's written down. And I don't want to be going out here. The dentist said, but in the Gospel of Yochanan, chapter 17, in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true Elohim, or Creator, and Yehoshua, Hamashiach, the anointed of Yahweh whom you have sent. So the definition of eternal life is to know what? Know the both. The Father and the Son. The one who was sent, right? And yet Messiah said when he came, he said, you know, if you'd known the Father, you'd know me. They didn't know him because they didn't know the Father. And then he said an awful lot of things. And if you go back and look carefully, how many times he said all the, the wrath, the tribulation, all these things going to come upon this wicked generation. He said this is an evil and adulterous generation, did he not? And a lot of things came upon that generation. And after he died, how long was it before the temple was destroyed? Forty years. If he died in AD 30, the temple was destroyed in 70. And I'm just, you know, not trying to give dates, but that's, you know, 40 years, right? When the people refused to go into the promised land, they rejected, you know, Yahweh's word, right? And they wandered for what? Forty years in the wilderness. Till when? Till that evil generation died off. Yeah, the same thing Messiah came. From the time of his death to the destruction of the temple was about 40 years. If we go back into Deuteronomy, who actually entered the promised land then? The children of those to whom the promise was made. <laughs> Messiah has come. The true word, the true promise, and he's come. And a lot of people rejected him at that time. And 40 years later, the temple was destroyed, and who he was seed? those who accepted afterwards, right? We're looking forward to a time frame, and, and I know people disagree with me, and that's fine, and, and a lot of different things, you know, what they call the rapture of the church. You know, I don't believe in the rapture of the church. I believe in the catching away of the bride. And the bride, you know, once, once the bride is gone, some people are going to become believers based upon what happened, not because it's going to be a, a worldwide thing that draws a whole lot of attention, but just because whatever happened so-and-so, I don't know, all of a sudden he was gone and clothes were laying there, or whatever. And then they're going to become believers, but they're going to have to go through this tribulation period. And what does it say in, in, in Isaiah chapter 26, you know, verse 20? Hide yourself as it were. Come, my people, hide yourself as it were in your kadar, the wedding chamber, until what? Until the indignation of the tribulation be overpassed. That's what he says. wonder why he would tell us that if it's not true. Why would he tell us things in Zephaniah and in Luke? You know, study to show yourself worthy. Pray always that you be considered worthy to escape all these things that are coming on the earth. Why tell us that if there's no chance of us escaping those things? Mm -hmm. It may be that you may be hidden in that day, it says in Zephaniah chapter 2 or 3 or 4 somewhere over there. <laughs> but all these things come from knowing what his word says and being able to apply it in our day-to-day, -day, everyday life. Who are you living for? Him? To be with Him? Or are you living for us for right now? What I want tomorrow. How many flower beds can I build? You know, how many houses can I make? What is the purpose? What are we living for? Are we looking forward to that day we're going to be with Him? 
He says he's only coming for those who are looking for him. <clears throat> Go back to Numbers, in verse 9. That every offering, referring to the heave offering, that which had been waived is now the heave offering, of all the holy things of the sons of Israel which they bring to the priest shall be his. Talking to the priest, right? If they bring it to him and give it to the priest, it belongs to him. And whatever man's holy or set apart thing shall be his, whatever any man gives the priest shall be his. Are consecrated to him, right? If you give something to somebody, it becomes theirs, right? Anybody ever wonder where this term Indian giver came from? <clears throat> Go to Exodus 28. Why does any of this matter? All of these things that we're reading about are reading about these people who were involved in the transporting, the lifting up, the carrying, the protecting of the word of Yahweh for future generations. And Ecclesiastes also tells us that which was is that which shall be. And that which shall be is that which has already been. There's nothing new under the sun. So whatever was is going to be. We have to know what was so that we know what is and what's going to be. And then we can determine what is really important in our life. In Exodus 28, in, in verse 36 through 38, it says, You shall also make a plate of pure gold. The word plate there is the number 6731. It's the word zitz. You know, people use the term zit zit referring to the fringe and the people wear, but this word here for plate is the word zit, singular, 6731. A zit, a plate of pure gold, and engrave on it the engraving of a signet. Kadosh le Yahweh, as what it said in Hebrew. Holiness or set apartness to Yahweh. This thing was on his plate, it was attached to this turban that Aaron wore, then it was tied on it with two blue threads. <coughs> Verse 37, and. You know, and is one of the little words that connects something with something else. <laughs> and you shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel hallow in all their holy or sacred gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before Yahweh. Who carried the sins of the people that brought thy sacrifices? Aaron, right? Isn't that what it said to the high priest? Mm -hmm. But the name Aaron means what? The light bringer. But who is the true light? Yehoshua. So is it talking about Aaron carrying all of our sins, or is it a picture back of Messiah Yehoshua, the true light, the one who's going to carry all of our sins away? Again, it's a picture of Messiah to come, to carry our sin. But you'll notice that everything that the people brought, the minute they made the decision to bring it, who did it belong to? It belonged to Yahweh. And Yahweh is saying then that those things are going to be belong to the priest whom they bring and give it to who does the ministering between him and them. Because the word Levite means what? Joined or attached to. And it was through the priest then. Well, a lot of people today like to run around and say, oh, well, we're a kingdom of priests, you know. Well, if you are, what you job? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to minister to people? For what you can get? <laughs> I mean, that's what a lot of them think, you know. What's in it for me? That's what they're out there trying to do. Aaron, the light bringer. Back in Numbers. <clears throat> in verse 10 it says, Every man's holy things shall be his. Whatever any man gives the priest shall be his. That means it's consecrated to him. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully toward him, and a man lies with her carnally, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and it is concealed that she had defiled herself, and there was no witness against her, nor was she caught. It means that she did it and got away with it, she thought. If the spirit of jealousy comes upon him, and he becomes jealous of his wife who has defiled herself. Now this statement is based on if the, you know, what the woman did was, was actually there, right? Or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife, although she has not defiled herself. 
See, there's a distinction between whether she did or whether she didn't. There's a, there's a separation here. <clears throat> These next verses, as we read, describe the ritual which is performed by a priest concerning the wife suspected of infidelity. She is suspected. Now, if she gets caught, sometimes she just says, okay, yeah, I did, and you know, you're going to do this. There's no point in it, right? But if there's no witness, she's suspected even though she denies, that's when the ritual would be performed. In the Talmud or in Hebrew liturgy, you can't find a listing or anywhere or a recording of it ever having been done. But just because it's not written down, does that mean it didn't happen? Okay? But as we go through this ritual and look at these little pieces, I want each one of us to think about a lot of things that took place with Messiah and what he said. I'll, I'll try to remind you. <laughs> Verse 15, Then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring the offering required for her, one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal, not the fine, refined flour of the wheat flour, which would be in the, you know, of anything, but this is a, a coarse ground barley meal. Barley is also what represents the grain of the first fruit, which is picture of Messiah Hoshua, right? He shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it because it is a grain offering of jealousy and offering for remembering or to bring to memory or to bring to knowledge. This whole thing then is to bring to knowledge what this woman did. For bringing iniquity to remembrance. Verse 16. <clears throat> Well, before we go on, go back to Leviticus 18. In, in, in chapter 18 and in verse 20. Verse 20 of Leviticus 18, Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. That's a direct, distinct statement. You're not supposed to do that, right? Have anything to do with your neighbor's wife, period, okay? <clears throat> if we go wrong, we'll find that those, the man and the woman who committed this, this act, do they get killed individually or do both get stoned to death? They're both stoned, right? When Messiah there, you know, in, in the Gospel of John, when they brought the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and they brought her out, I don't know what they did with the man, but then they brought her out. Now the scripture says that they were searching for some reason to condemn him. So they brought the woman to Messiah and they said this woman was caught in the very act. And then they said, now the Torah says that she should be stoned. What do you say? Remember Torah says both of them get stoned. But they said, what do you say? And remember the scripture says that they said this searching for some reason to condemn him. They were looking at the hip. They were, they were wanting to kill him, right? But he said, what do you say? And then, you know, he went through the thing, you know, of kneeling down and, and riding in the dirt or, or, or you know. Anyway, making his finger. <clears throat> but then in verse 25, it said, mm -hmm. he's told not to have these things, not to do these things. In verse 25, it said, For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its inheritance. It iniquity upon it and the land vomits out its inhabitants. We all realize that the house of Israel the house of Judah was kicked out of the land a long time ago, right? It wasn't because they were righteous. Okay. You know how so many times in Orthodox, you know, Judaism they try to talk about, you know, the, the righteous servant was really the house of Israel, not the Messiah. You got news to you, the house of Israel never been totally righteous, you know. <clears throat> but adultery in the physical sense is a picture of idolatry in a spiritual sense or worship. Adultery is something that takes place at that point in time because whatever it is you're fixing to do seems to be a whole lot more uh, make you want it more than something else, right? It's one of those types of things that takes place a lot of times just in the instant things, you know, and, and without real strength people don't resist and it winds up affecting them for the rest of their life and can't. To go back to Numbers, <clears throat> back up in verse 15, Then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring the offering required for her, one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. 
he shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it because it is a grain offering of jealousy an offering for remembering for bringing iniquity to remembrance or bringing it out making it known the priest shall bring her near and set her before Yahweh or in the presence of Yahweh and it's funny when you go looking for leprosy you take them to the priest you don't go to the doctor if you're looking for some kind of moral sin you take them to the priest you don't go to somebody else everything that had to be done was what is done through the priest and it's all based on a comparison of Yahweh's word. Verse 17, The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. Hot, what in the world is holy water? Or set apart water? Now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious, but we, you know, we've heard this thing battered around and thrown around and everything else. And yet the only place that you can get holy water in Scripture is what in, in Numbers chapter 19. And how is that water made? Uh, the word holy there in verse 17 is in number 6918. It is Kadosh. Water is 4325. And literally in the Hebrew that says Mayim Chodeshim. Set apart water. Now in John chapter 2, Gospel of John, in verse 6, now this was at the wedding, you know, that we talked about earlier there in chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, but in verse 6 it said, now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Yehudi containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Water is what the manner of purification. So what was this? How did he make this purification water? Remember, this water was for purification or purging from sin, right? That's what this water was all about. This woman then is fixing to what? It's either be going to be brought up to everybody's knowledge of what she did, or she's going to be purified. One or the other. This water that Moses was told to make became the what? The holy water. And I promise you, this holy water is not anything like <laughs> organized religion's idea of what their holy water is. You know, I don't care how fancy the faucet was they got it from. Okay? <laughs> well, we're going to get there, yeah. Now go to Numbers 19. You're trying to get ahead of me again just because you heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> He's afraid I'm going to miss it. I know. But in Numbers chapter 19, <clears throat> verse 9, Then a man clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer, this red heifer that was burned, and store outside the camp in a clean place, and they shall be kept for the congregation, for the sons of Israel, for the water of purification or impurity. It is for purifying from sin. That's what this water was for. Now we're told here in this ritual they're going to take this holy water, this set apart water, and look down in verse 21. It shall be a perpetual statute for them. He who sprinkles the water of purification shall wash his clothes, and he who touches the water of purification shall be unclean until evening. Whoever is doing the purification of the purging or making somebody else clean becomes unclean in the process. It's kind of like whoever removes our sins becomes sin in the process. Isn't that Messiah Yehoshua? He was made to be sin for us. He never committed any sin, so what sin did he have? He took ours. Scripture said he took every disease and everything, you know, that, that man had. He carried them all on himself. He became everything so that we might be what? He came to purify us. Let's get a hold then of what this water purification is all about and what it's for and what this ritual of purification is in this woman and what she's suspected of. And by the way, we're all supposed to be the bride of the Messiah. So in a lot of ways, any adultery or idolatry that we may have done has to be pured, purified and cleansed, right? I mean, if we look at those thoughts, okay? <clears throat> so, go back, you know, number, running water, 
mixed with the with the ash of the of the red cow is water set apart for purification of sin. And we read there the water can be used externally to sprinkle on people or articles, okay? Now, going back into numbers here in, in, in verse uh, 16, the priest shall bring her near and sit before Yahweh. Verse 17, the priest shall take the holy water, the set apart water, this water which was created for the purifying or purging from sin, okay? The priest shall take this set apart water in an earthen vessel. Isn't that funny? This earthen vessel is kind of like a bowl that's made out of the clay or the dirt of the earth, right? And yet we made out of the same dirt, right? If you could, if you say the land of Israel or Eretz Israel, the land, okay, well, who is Israel? And a lot of times he refers to the land of Israel as his people. Well, his people made out of the same dirt. I heard a man say one time, fish are made out of dirt, just watery dirt. But all of us are made from the dirt of the earth, okay? <clears throat> In... Uh, The water from the dust in an earthen vessel will take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. The dust that's on the floor of the tabernacle. I know everybody thinks, if you stop thinking about it, all the things that were made for the tabernacle and the priest and everything to use, there was never any kind of clothing made for the priest. There was never any kind of shoes made. <coughs> The Messiah Hosher, you know, and, 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 and the Rekindle Redeemer, it all goes through it, you know, taking off the shoe is the same. But everywhere Messiah walked, it was holy ground, right? He didn't, he didn't wear any shoe. But they take this dust from the floor of the tabernacle. Remember also that, that, that when Messiah was here, he sent those people into the different towns to preach the people. And he said, when you come, if they won't receive what you have to say, then what? You just shake the dust off your feet and go on about your business. It's kind of another picture again, you know, the dust, you know, whatever it is. <clears throat> Beside when he knelt down and they brought that woman out and he knelt down and all of them were looking at what he was fixing to do and then they all went out, you know, very, very uh, uh, <clears throat> subdued because they understood what he was doing. And the scriptures over in, in Jeremiah says what? Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the fountain of living waters. And who is he? The fountain of living water. And the scripture that we just read there, you know, quoted there from Jeremiah, has been being taught and read by every priest and rabbi at the Feast of the Living Water, which is one of those days during the Feast of Tabernacles, by every one for years. And they knew that when he wrote down, then they were trying to depart from him, and their name were written in that dust. The, this is the same thing. The dust here is part of this ritual for whether this woman is telling true or not. You take the water with dust from the floor of the tabernacle. The ground was cursed, was it not? When Adam sinned, the curse came on the earth, right? So this ground which was cursed, he picked up this dirt and mixed it with the holy water. The set apart water, the washing of the word, let's say. One of them is going to bring a curse on you, one of them is going to purify you. I mean, we, you know, one or the other. It's put into an earthen or clay vessel. The word of Yahweh, which created the heavens and the earth and became flesh, is also a clay vessel, is he not? <clears throat> Go to Genesis 3 and verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Has that curse ever been lifted yet? So it's still here. Isn't it amazing? Everything that's very, very modern pertains right back to what it says in Genesis. Still the same. Now, hold your place in numbers, but go over to John chapter 8.
in uh, John chapter 8 and in verse 6, as Brother Messiah said, this they said, testing him that they might have of which to accuse him. See, they said all that thing was a lie. They were testing him just to see what he was saying so that, you know, if he got it wrong, they could accuse him of something. Mm -hmm. Remember, they were looking for some reason to kill him. But Yehoshua stooped down and wrote on the ground with his fingers, though he did not hear. <clears throat> Go back to Numbers. Verse 17, The priest shall take holy water, the set-apart water, the water that is designed for the purification of sin, in an earthen vessel, and take of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. You mix the curse with the one who is pure. Did not Messiah come and became the curse? He wore the curse. He wore the crown of thorns. The thorns came into existence when everything was a curse, you know, because of the sin of Adam. Verse 18, Then the priest shall stand the woman before Yahweh, or in the presence of, our word before from the Hebrew means in the presence of, not necessarily in front of, but in the presence of. Yahweh uncovered the woman's head and put the offering for remembering in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. She's got the grain offering in her hand. And the priest is standing there with this bitter water that brings a curse. The bitter water, what is this? Water purification mixed with the dust of the earth. One's cursed, the other is pure. The water will take the curse off of us. Is that true? What this woman's been accused of, but when she drinks this water and everything, you know, what happens then is going to be, you know, recognized whether she's honest or, or not, depending on what happens. And uncover the woman's head in verse 18, the number is 6544. The word itself is upa'ara in the Hebrew. And it means to loosen, to expose, to be free from restraint. The Pentateuch actually says in, in, in this particular passage, let the hair of the woman's head go loose. <laughs> what the Pentateuch said. <clears throat> and remember also the barley again is the grain of the first fruits. And who is the first fruits from the dead? The Sayyid and in Genesis 1 1, Bereshit. In him, in the first fruits, everything was created. And then that's what John says again. So, it all a picture of Messiah, in a way, it's a picture of him and what he does removing the curse from us. And this same thing goes for her. Water is a symbol of the Word. The Word itself contains both blessing and curse. And it says, You choose. Right? Verse 19. <clears throat> and the priest shall put her under oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray to uncleanness, under your husband's authority is implied, be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. If you haven't strayed, be free from it. But if you have gone astray under your husband, and if you have defiled yourself, and some man other than your husband has lain with you. Before we go and read verse 21, I'll go, to, go to Romans 7. I know that there's a lot of, uh, and I'm not going to get into that type of discussion right now about marriage and divorce and all this kind of stuff, but I just want to just mention... I'm going to read this one, but write down Romans 7, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> and then 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. And they all say the same thing. But here in Romans 7, in 1, 2, and 3, it said, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, the Torah, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? You reckon he still meant this? This was even after the death, burial, and resurrection? And he's saying that the law had dominion over man as long as he lived. It had nothing to do with what Messiah did or didn't do, did it? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. As long as the husband is still alive, she's still under that law. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. 
But basically what it says is you're under the law of your husband as long as you live. I think there's a scripture that says Yahweh, your maker, is your husband. And if we're supposed to be the bride, then whose law are we supposed to be under? I mean, you know, you can bring these things around and make comparisons, you know, it, it all comes back to the same thing. It's still going back to obedience to the Torah. Now, verse 19, again, the waters of the, of the oath, if innocent, they're free from the water that brings a curse. The washing of the water of the word. The word to one is life, to the other it's death, right? It can bring either one. And which one it brings is based on what? What you do. Not what somebody else thinks. Not what somebody else says about you. Not what somebody else writes about you. What you do in regards to what Yahweh's word says. Somebody else ain't got no bearing. It's strictly one on one. Verse 21. Then the priest shall put the woman under the oath of the curse. And he shall say to the woman... Yahweh make you a curse and an oath among your people when Yahweh makes your thigh rot and your belly swell. Now, I don't want to get into graphic here, but that word thigh in the Hebrew, the number is 3409. It's the Hebrew word yarek. This is one of those words where it has a literal meaning, but it also has a euphemistic meaning. You know, Euphemism is when you say something in a nice way instead of saying something, you know, that would really hurt somebody. I, I, you know, uh, and, and, uh, we, we would say that somebody passed on rather than saying they kicked a the bucket or they're dead. So we said they passed on, right? That word that's translated thigh, 3409 Yarek, it means the thigh literally because of the softness of the flesh. But a euphemism of the meaning of the word is the generative parts. You remember when Abraham sent the man out and he said he put his hand under his thigh as an oath? What you're doing is when you put somebody under an oath and they put their hand under the thigh, you are making an oath that you are bound by this oath and that you bind all future seed that comes from you under that oath. The generative part. All mankind is bound under what Adam did. When he broke Yahweh's word, he brought the curse on everybody, right? When Adam sinned, what was lost? Eternal life. Replaced by what? Death. <laughs> Messiah came what? To restore eternal life. And He what? He gives eternal life to those who you will receive Him and you know, accept it. That's what He came to do. So Yahweh make you a curse and an oath among your people when Yahweh makes your thigh rot and your belly swell. The generative parts. <clears throat> Verse 22, And may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot. Then the woman shall say, O main, so be it. Then the priest shall write these curses in a book and he shall scrape off into the bitter water. Now you stop and think about that. You know, they write it in a book, you know, scribe it, whatever it is, whatever they write it on can be scratched off and then these things go into the water. So you've got the words of the curse being mixed with the water. <laughs> okay? And they're going to take it internally. If you stop and think about how many times did he appear to a different prophet and he gave him this scroll or he showed him the scroll and he told him, he said, now go eat the scroll or eat the roll or eat the book or eat the word. How many times does it say in the scripture that the word appeared to a prophet? The word appeared, and they took it. And whatever the word appeared to them, then they spoke whatever the, what the word was, whatever the word said. Verse twenty-four. Well, actually, the word twenty-three, and the word scrape. You know, you scrape off into the. You know, that word is is, is forty-two twenty-nine. It's the Hebrew word, umachaa. Those of you that speak Hebrew, forgive my pronunciation. I'm doing the best I can. It means to blot or to rub or to stroke. By implication, it means to erase them. You erase them then from the, from what you wrote it on and put them into something else. You put these words that are written in the water and then the words are dissolved into the bitter water. 
the words of the curse become part of the water. Verse 24, And he shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and the water that brings the curse shall enter her to become bitter. If you remember when Moses was leading the people out, they came to a place that was springs and the water was bitter, and they called it Maror, the bitter water. And then what? Yahweh showed him a tree, and he went and got the tree, and he cut it, and he threw it into the bitter waters, and it made what? It made the water sweet. But he was that, you know, that tree then was representing Messiah Yehoshua again, a picture of what he was going to do. And yet we have the same symbolism here if we look at it with the words and the curse and the water. And this water that we drink and eat and everything. And Messiah said, unless you eat my flesh, you have no part of me. Didn't he say that? Well, he's not teaching cannibalism. What's he talking about eating? Eating the word. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> In verse 25, Then the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, shall wave the offering before Yahweh, and bring it to the altar. The priest shall take a handful of the offering as its memorial portion, burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings the curse will enter, become bitter, and her belly will swell, her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among her people. You know, if somebody just confesses a sin, you can be forgiven. When you try to hide it, then that becomes something that what swells up and makes you, you know, become rotted and all kinds of stuff, right? Now, even if the woman had confessed her sin, she may have been stoned, but she would have been free from the curse of the word. You, you follow what I'm saying? But people are so afraid sometimes <clears throat> to take responsibility for what they did because they think it's so bad. And yet, you know, it's not near as bad what it's going to be. <laughs> Verse 28, But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children or sons. Isn't that amazing? Children are a blessing from Yahweh. But she's proved, and it's the Word that proved it. Okay? <clears throat> if she is innocent, the bitter water brings no harm. Okay. If guilty, then the water brings the punishment and the sin becomes exceedingly manifest. You realize what you know it, what this one would go through and, and I'm sure there would be a lot of pain and everything else involved in it. And it would be there visible for everybody else to see. Go to Romans chapter seven. <clears throat> In verse 13. And he's talking about verse 12. Therefore the Torah of the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. In verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Wait a minute. Isn't this just exactly talking about what this woman just drank? Has then what is good? The water of purification? <laughs> Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. You see what this woman did and the rituals she was put through and if the sin was real and she kept denying it then the sin itself became very, very evident and very painful in her life. But it was made manifest to everybody else of what was true. And the word that she drank with the dust and the words in it produced this effect. Now, don't you think that most people, if they were <clears throat> guilty, they'd just say, okay, I did it, <laughs> you know, and not have to go through this stuff? Mm -hmm. And yet today, we don't seem to have the knowledge of what to do and how to do that. You know, if you confess your sin and own up to it, then you can be forgiven. <coughs> but unconfessed sin in your life, there's no forgiveness, right? How can there be? Because if you're not confessing your sin, then you're saying, I didn't sin, and that's saying that Yahweh is a liar. Isn't that, isn't that what the Scriptures teach? What I'm trying to get at, we talk about New Testament, we talk about the things in our life, and yet these rituals, these things that took place and are written back in Torah, all explain what Messiah is going to do when He comes. But if we don't look for Messiah in all of it, then we'll never see Him. 
Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Actually, verse 24 through 29, it is, you know, we all see these verses. And remember, it's, it's the, the letter writer here who's using the, the, the marriage, man and woman, to represent between uh, Yahweh and his bride. And verse 24 says, Therefore, just as the ecclesia, the called out ones, is subject to the Mashiach, the anointed of Yahweh, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives. Just as the Mashiach also loved the called out ones and gave himself for them or it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The washing of water by the word. This ritual that this woman just went through, it had water. It had the word written, scraped off and put in it. It had the dust mixed in with it. The washing of water by the word. The water of purification. The water of purification, purified from sin in the same picture of what? The word that we receive. Messiah talking to his disciples, he said, What? You are clean because of the word which I've already given you. All you need to do now is what? Wash your feet. That's the way you walk, your course of life. And then he got down there and he washed the disciples' feet there that night, right? And he said, What I do now, you don't know, but later you will understand. You know, Peter, when he went to wash his feet, what did Peter say? You know, you know fishermen are they? You know, oh, I just washed my whole body. He said, No, you're already clean because of the word. You just need to wash your feet. We need to wash our hands and our feet every day. And that says who we serve and who we walk in the course of life that we follow. Are we following the dictates of the world or are we following what Yahweh's Word says? That's the difference. Verse 27, That he might present it to himself a glorious ecclesia, or called out one, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy or set apart and without blemish. How big a spot could it have and not be a spot? How small a sin can it be and not be a sin? If it's a sin, it's a sin, right? There's no, you know, I don't care how big it is. If it's big or little, it's the same thing. The only place where there's a real difference is in our eyes looking at somebody else most of the time. <laughs> is that right? But do we ever look at ourselves according to what the water says, the Word? The labor in the tabernacle made out of the copper mirrors of the women who served, Right? You look in a mirror, you know, in a copper, you see yourself, right? It's kind of like in that labor made out of these mirrors. You look in the water, the washing, the word, and you see yourself the way Yahweh sees you. Well, that's a strong picture, isn't it? Verse 28, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Yahweh does the ecclesia of the called out ones. The whole picture, the whole resemblance then is to be what? Washed by the washing of the water of the Word. You be obedient and you wash and then the Word shows and will manifest you to somebody else. That's why Messiah said what? You're the light of the world. Isn't that what he says? If the light ad uh, abides in you, right? What does it say in Isaiah? Anybody who doesn't speak according to this Word is because there is no light in them. And he never said, well, that's going to change later. <laughs> just, that's what it said, and that's, that's what it means. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Eleven through 14. I like these little verses because so many people, you know, say, oh, well, you know, he mailed that law to the cross. If he is the law of the Torah, then he got nailed for the execution state, not the law. <laughs> but in verse 11, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made by hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the Mashiach. That's what this thing is talking about. It's removing the covering of sin that was on you because of what we had done, and he took our sins and took them away. Now that circumcision is removing of what was covering us. Now you go back to the covering of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then you have what? You've got the white righteousness underneath first. And then you got what? The black representing the, sin <laughs> the sins of the world. And then you got the red, which is the blood covering everything. And then you got the dugong, which is no reputation. So everything's still covered. 
It's a covering. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with through faith in the working of Yahweh who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. They wrote the curse on the tablet and scraped it off into the water, made the woman drink. <coughs> she had the dust, the dirt. The curse then was based on our sins, right? The handwriting that was against us were all of our sins, everything that we'd committed. Every time you ever broke the Torah, it's written down against you. So was the law done away with or nailed to the execution stake? Our Messiah was nailed to it and he became sin for us. So the sins is what was nailed to the cross, not the Torah, not the law. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The law was never contrary to us. The law is just and holy and good, it says in Romans. Did we read that? So what was it that was contrary to us? It's our sins and a list of them that have what caused us to die. And these have to be removed. Okay, going back to, to, to numbers again there. <clears throat> In verse 27, when he has made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings a curse will enter, become bitter, her belly will swell, her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children. This is the law of jealousy when a wife under her husband's authority goes astray and defiles himself. Does it not say that Yahweh is a jealous Elohim? Doesn't he want us to be purified and pure? And he's taken the steps necessary when we become and we eat the flesh, we drink the word, we become pure in his eyes. And we become the pure, clean bride that he's looking for. But every time we break the law, then we've got that speck. Then we've got that blemish, right? Because transgression of the law is what sin is, and that's what it is. It says in Revelation, yanking somebody out of the fire, hating the blemish brought on by what? By the flesh. We've got to quit living according to what this flesh and its wants and all these things that we say we want and start living according to what this word says because then we're doing what he wants. That's what it's all about. Okay. Again, verse 29, this is the law of jealousy when a wife under her husband goes astray and defiles herself. Or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he becomes jealous of his wife, then he shall stand the woman before Yahweh and the priest shall execute all this law upon her. Then the man shall be free from iniquity, but that woman shall bear her guilt. It's more talking about our relationship between Yahweh you know, and us as the bride and he as the bridegroom than anything else. Who is the friend of the bridegroom in Torah? Moshe. Who is the one that Yahweh said, you go take them out and bring them out on the third day after they've purified and washed themselves and bring them out to meet with Yahweh where? Under the mountain or at the foot of the mountain. The Hebrew says says under the mountain. It's a Hebrew idiomatic expression, is it not? But what does under the mountain mean in the Hebrew expression? Under the hoopah. It's kind of the same thing as we talk about, you know, Turkey Day. We all know that that's an idiomatic expression referring to thanksgiving is what we use. Well, then the other is under the hoopah. So what took place on that day when the Torah was given? Ketubah. The marriage contract was given between Yahweh and his bride. He goes back then, going to prepare a place for you, and then Moses goes, and he's going to lead the people out, you know, to come meet. Okay. Verse 31, Then the man shall be free from iniquity, but that woman shall bear her guilt. One thing about it, <clears throat> that man can never say anything again because that woman has been proved not guilty. <laughs> okay. Chapter 6. <clears throat> then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to Yahweh. 
when he takes the vow of a Nazarite. Remember the word Nazarite is a number 5139. The word means separate or separated. That is an unpruned vine. An unpruned vine is going to look different from a vine that's been pruned, right? The thing about it is, he talks about, you know, we look at vines and we talk about grape vines. And so what, anybody that's ever raised grapes or grape vines, you know you've got to go out and you have to prune them, right? And if they really bear fruit good this year, then you've got to prune them even more next year so they bear more fruit, right? So if we really look bad, we're just being pruned. Okay, so that's, yeah, we're trying to bring fruit more, you know, more fruit. <laughs> <clears throat> in uh, this Nazarite vow and he takes it to separate himself to Yahweh he shall separate himself from wine and we have the word similar drink actually it's strong drink you know he shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from drink, neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisin. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. That means you can eat plums, right? I mean, let's, let's, he's talking about the grapevine is what he's saying, the food of the grape, right? A lot of places in Scripture refers to the, the juice that comes out of the grape as the blood of the grape, right? And yet when Messiah at, at the Passover, when he held up the cup and he said, what, this is the blood of the new covenant, right? New covenant. Or as he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Isn't that what he said? I was checking y'all out. Okay. <laughs> but what the word covenant, if you look up the word covenant in the Greek, Actually, if you look at the word covenant or testament, either one, in the Greek text, you'll find that in all cases it's the same number. It's the number 1242 in the Greek. And it's the same word throughout. And it has the same definition when you look it up. And it means what? Disposition. So when he held up that cup, he said, this is a new disposition in my blood. Disposition of what? Sin. Before then, how was sin covered? Through the blood of animals? But we're told that the blood of bulls and goats and stuff could never do away with sin. So he had to come. And then he said, this is a new disposition referring to the sin in his blood. And that removes sin. Right? It's really pretty simple, isn't it? But at that point in time, it wasn't his blood in the cup because he hadn't gone to execution stake yet. So we have to understand then that the blood of the grape was a symbolic of, of his blood. Okay. The word wine in... in, in uh, Verses here, 3 through 5, it is the number 3196. It's the word Yagin. And then the word that's translated similar, which is actually strong drink, is the number 7941. It's the word Shekar. And you know, it tells us over in other places that Shekar, strong drink, is what you give to somebody, you know, like when they're hurt, you know, or shot, or fixed to die, or something to remove pain, and this type of thing. But there's no fruit of the vine of any kind. In verse 5, all the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to Yahweh. He shall be set apart. He shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Isn't it amazing? If he tells you don't cut your hair, you let it grow during the time of your vow, then that implies that in the other time you cut your hair and keep it trimmed, right? Over in Ezekiel, where it talks about the new temple that's going to be built, which we haven't seen yet. And it says that the people that enter that, you know, whether they're priests or Levites or whoever enter into that temple, no man goes in there unless what the hair of his head is neatly trimmed. The only question I got, and, and this was really brought home to me real tough one day when somebody asked me, he says, well, when somebody cuts your head off, you know, does the beard go with it? <laughs> it do, don't it? So the hair of your head being neatly trimmed includes your beard and your hair and everything else neatly trimmed. You don't go into the temple looking like what? ZZ Top or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> or whoever those, you know. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> In verse 6, all the days that he separates himself to Yahweh, he shall not go near a 
dead body. That's that word, 5315 nefesh. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die because his separation to Elohim is on his head. Does anybody get an understanding of how important it is to Yahweh when you make this vow to Him to be separated unto Him? Nothing can interfere with that. Period. Because He's taken the vow. Is it important if you take a vow to keep it? Is it a sin if you don't make a vow? No. Is it a sin if you make a vow and don't keep it? So what you say then, you bind yourself, what? According to what the Word says. When you bind yourself according to what the Word says, it's the same thing as drinking the water that brings a curse. Which is what the woman drank. Now we can think about just a woman and a husband, but think about it as us being the woman, the bride and Messiah. Have we entered into an adulterous situation by following some other God or putting somebody else ahead of what Yahweh said do? I, I hope I'm trying to make this thing clear. I'm not trying to put somebody in a bind, but I'm trying to get us to understand the picture that He's given of our relationship between Him and us. Who are we? I know some of us are men, we got beards, but we're still brides. That's kind of a hard thing to consider, isn't it? <laughs> In verse 7 there, because his separation is on his head, that number of separation is 5145. It, it is the Hebrew word nezer, nezer, 5145. And it means something set apart, i.e., unshorn locks. You let your hair grow all the time that you're under this vow, and then the hair is, is what? Is something that's set apart because at the end of this vow, what are you going to do? You're going to go down and cut your hair. You're going to shave off all the hair. But this hair then is a symbol of consecration. Now, if you go back and remember one of King David's sons, he had this beautiful hair, and instead of being a symbol of his consecration, he took pride in it. And all of a sudden, one day, after he was instigating, he had to get his father killed and take over the throne and all this kind of stuff like that, riding around. And he runs under a tree and his hair gets hung up in a tree branch and he gets removed from the horse. And it was his pride then in what was originally given to him for something that was good and he made it into something else. And what happened while he's hanging there? He got dead. <laughs> and people came and they, they you know, removed it, right? But it's, again, it's a picture of what can happen when something that's good becomes something that's bad. Even though we not, may not be realizing what we're doing, it would be do it. And it's not breaking the Sabbath or, 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 breaking, or eating the poor chops or whatever. People do things and it's our relationship that he's really trying to get straight on. Verse 8, all the days of his separation, he shall be holy or set apart to Yahweh. And if anyone dies very suddenly beside him and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall save it. And on the seventh day. Now as we look at these things, we're going to be looking at things that take place on the third day and things that take place on the seventh day. And then trying to figure out which one, because a lot of times they bring you the seventh day before they bring you the third day. You know, he kind of got the order that things happen. Verse 10, Then on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall offer one as a sin offering, the other as a burned offering, and make atonement for him because he sinned by reason of the body. And he shall sanctify his head that same day. He shall consecrate to Yahweh the days of his separation and bring a male lamb in his first year as a trespass offering, but the former days shall be lost because his separation was defiled. The first days are going to be considered void because he became defiled. Does he take it very seriously that you're supposed to be purified or perfect all the time of your having this vow, right? And if you do something that breaks it, then what? It's all lost. It's, it's void. It's nothing. You have to start over. Verse 13, Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall present his offering to Yahweh, one male lamb in its first year, without blemish as a burnt offering. 
one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering, one ram without blemish as a peace offering, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil in their grain offering with their drink offerings. Then the priest shall bring before Yahweh and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice, a peace offering to Yahweh. With the basket of unleavened bread, the priest shall also offer its grain offering and its drink offering. Then the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting and shall take the hair from his consecrated head, put it on the fire which is on the sacrifice of the peace offering. The priest shall take the boiled shoulder of the ram one unleavened cake from the basket and one unleavened wafer and put upon the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his consecrated here is implied and the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before Yahweh they are holy that is set apart for the priest together with the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering after that the Nazarite may drink wine remember it talks about the breast you know we call that the brisket one of the, you know, one of the best parts, you know, of something. Verse 21, This is the law of the Nazarite who vows to Yahweh the offering for his separation. Besides that, whatever else his hand is able to provide according to the vow which he takes, so he must do according to the law of his separation. You take a Nazarite vow, Yahweh doesn't take it lightly. You take a Nazarite vow, you better not take it lightly. When you make a commitment... To Yahweh's word to do it does it mean anything if you're going to make a sacrifice to Yahweh and you give him something that didn't cost you nothing where's the sacrifice there's none there <clears throat> go to Acts 21 and we'll, you know <clears throat> All these things that it's talking about, and in here in Acts chapter 21, and starting in verse 17, it said, And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, as implied, Paul went in with us to James, remember, James and Yaakov. And all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which Elohim had done among the nations through his ministry. And when they heard, they glorified Yahweh, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the Torah. Myriad is a number that means indefinite or indeterminate number. You know, it could have been thousands or whatever groups, you know. And the word Jews has come from the word Yehudi, which means the people of the land. It's not the word Jude as would come from the tribe of Judah, but Yehudi is referring to all people of the land. They weren't called Yehudi until after the return from Babylon. And at that time, the house of Israel, you know, had been gone to captivity in 722, and they were gone. So then uh, Judah went into captivity, and they came back, you know, 70 years later. Actually, only 49,000 of the 2 million that went came back. But they began to be applied, uh, the term Yehudi began to be applied to all of them at that time. But he said, they are all zealous for the law of the Torah, in verse 20. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Yehudi who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to customs. <coughs> he said, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them. The purification is what, you know, the things that you do to purify yourself is a vow, right? And it's saying, you take these men and you go be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their head. The shaving of the head only takes place after everything else is offered, after the sacrifice is done, and, and that, that had to be paid. So Paul is then being told, you're going to make the payment, you know, you're going to pay for all these people to see these things, to do these things so that all of them may shave their heads. And that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing but you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law, the Torah. That word keep there in the English, I don't know what the word is in the Greek, but if it was to go back to the Hebrew, it would be what? 8104, shamar, which means to what? To guard, to protect, 
to build a fence around, to hedge about, to guard the word of Yahweh with your life. Are we willing to do that? <laughs> I remember Messiah one time talking to the disciples when they was out there in the garden with him that night, you know, that he was fixing to go and he come to him, you know, and, and they were asleep. And he said, couldn't you watch with me one hour? You know, in the mind they were willing, but the flesh was weak. That's the thing that we have to be on guard against so many times is how easy it is for our flesh to get in the way and to cause us to go against what we said we, you know, we were going to do. Flesh is weak. <clears throat> Verse 25, But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written aside that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. These are only the four things that they have to do. Does this mean that that's all they have to do to be saved? No. It just means that when they're coming out of all these pagan religions, <laughs> you got to get rid of your idols. you got to quit drinking blood. you got to quit having sex with temple priests, you know, priestesses and all this kind of stuff. Because you're going to be going into the synagogues on the Sabbath. You're going to be hearing the Torah read. Moses is going to be being taught on the Sabbath. And you're going to learn the thing that you're supposed to do. But you have to give up these four things when you come out of paganism. That's all he's saying. And one thing, you know, what he's saying is this is a start. You give up these things and you start going to the synagogues. And they're taking that in religions now. And I said, that's all you ever got to do. So that means as long as I do them things, then I can shoot, kill, rape, murder, whatever. And I'm still going to heaven. And any preacher who ever did a, 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 a funeral, how many times have you ever say them, this one didn't make it? <laughs> they never say that. Everyone that they ever you know, served that went to heaven, right? No matter how bad they were. But what does Scripture say? Scripture doesn't agree with that, does it? Verse 26, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Paul was totally in line with what the Torah says. And yet they heard that he'd been teaching to do away with it, right? How many people today say that Paul came and he's doing away with the law? How many people today when you talk to them, they'd say, well, Paul said, I don't care what Paul said, what did Messiah say? I don't really think Paul disagreed with what Messiah said, but his words are taken totally out of context and it made to have some other kind of meeting. But Paul said he imitated Messiah. If he imitated Messiah, then he'd do what he said and what he did. <laughs> right? If Paul came to do away with the law, then what he's doing right here made him a hypocrite. And if you want to believe Paul, why would you believe Paul and build a religion based on Paul and ignore what Messiah said? Paul can't save you. Can he? But yet we hear these things all the time from people and it's obvious they really don't know what the Word says. All they really know is what somebody said it said. And that may have been third or fourth or fifth handed. They don't really know what it said. <clears throat> okay. Go back to numbers. <laughs> Get off my soapbox. Some of this stuff though is just easy to preach on. You know <laughs> In verse 22, I think it's kind of interesting. Now, I'm, I'm not necessarily holding as that scripture that that's in, comes right behind this scripture has something associated with it. But in this case, it, could, it very well could have, you know. Because now he says in verse 22, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, because that and is the conjunction that ties it all together. And he spoke to Moshe. I've got a, I've got a disc somewhere that has the... Uh, the ironic blessing and it's actually saying with the words you know the true name of Yahweh and so forth in the blessing <clears throat> but I can't play it on anything except the computer and right now it's occupied <laughs> but if somebody one of these days will help me get something that will play mp3 you know beside this and then we can we can maybe we after this after, after we eat we'll come back and we'll play it so everybody can hear it <clears throat> But in verse 23, speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the sons of Israel. Say to them. In verse 24, Yahweh, 
Yahweh bless you and keep you. That's three Hebrew words in that line. You might say that three, when you begin to start looking at the numbers and everything, three is a number of a perfect witness. You see, the festivals are given as a witness of Yehoshua. And there's three of those festivals that are commanded, each person shall be in, or each man in Jerusalem at that time. So three kind of, you know, the perfect witness of Yehoshua. In verse 25, Ya'er Yahweh p'nav alaka v'chu neka. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. There's five words in that sentence. If three is the word of perfect witness, then five is perfect grace or favor. To find favor with Yahweh. In verse 26, Yisa ay Yahweh panav halika veyasim lacha shalom. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. There are seven words in that one. And seven Shiva is perfect completion. So in this you've got the perfect witness, the favor of Yahweh, and the completion of all things. I think it's kind of a marvelous thing. <clears throat> Verse 27 says, So they shall put my name on the sons of Israel, and I will bless them. Now you know, of course, that I believe women are included in this, but it's just in mixed company. The masculine terms are always used, not the feminine. So, the, you know. But go to Isaiah chapter 43. a real debate when I look at this. Do I want to read verses 1 through 9 or do I want to go on and read verses 1 through 15? So <clears throat> rather than back up, we're just going to read through 15, okay? But in Isaiah 43, But now thus says Yahweh, who created you, O Yaakov, and he who formed you, O Yisrael. You see, he uses both names there, right? One for one thing and one referring to the change that took place. He uses both names. He says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Verse 3, For Ani Yahweh Elohecha, the Holy One of Israel, and it says your Savior. The number there is three, four, six, seven. The translated Savior, the Hebrew word Yahshua should be deliverer. I am the one, <clears throat> the Holy One of Israel, your deliverer. Is it important to know that his name is Yehoshua because Yehoshua means Yahweh is your deliverer? I know people say Yeshua means salvation, Yehosh, you know, all these different things, but he's not ever saying that he is your what salvation he is, but he is the deliverer, the man, the messenger of Yahweh. Malachi says he is the messenger of the covenant. He is the messenger of the disposition. He came to deliver. If we accept what he's come to deliver, then we have received our salvation, our deliverance. I don't have a problem with that. But his name means Yahweh is deliverer. We need to understand that. Verse 3 again, For Ani, Yahweh Eloheka, the Holy One of Israel, your deliverer, I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place, since you were precious in my sight. You have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, Give them up, and to the south, Do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. 
Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, It is truth emit. You are my witnesses, says Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand. I, me, I am he. Before me there was no ill form, nor shall there be after me. I, Ani, even I, Ani, 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 Yahweh. <coughs> and besides me there is no deliverer. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says Yahweh, that I am Elohim. Indeed, before the day was... Ani, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Thus says Yahweh, your Goel, 1350, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. Verse 15, Ani, Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel your king <clears throat> we go back now verse 27 in Numbers chapter 6 there so they shall put my name on the children of Israel the sons of Israel and I will bless them but he says Yahweh bless you Yahweh make Yahweh lift up but the name is also is it, we're not called Yahweh are we we're called Israel, aren't we? But we're called Israel, and also the name of the one who came to deliver us I mean, is Yehoshua. I mean, Yahshua, Yeshua. A lot of it, I'm not trying to argue with people over pronunciation, okay? But the one thing that I would really like the people to see is another phrase that states exactly what his name is. Can we go to Revelation? <coughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have it in my notes. I didn't, you know, you gotta get get off somewhere. <clears throat> Let's back up to verse seven here, Revelation uh, nineteen. And he said, Let us be glad and rejoice, or give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of Elohim. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, I am your fellow servant. Th those words, see that you do not do that. None of those words are in the Greek text. But he said to me, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yehoshua. Worship El for the testimony of Yehoshua is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Yehoshua is the festivals of Yahweh which witness and testify of what he's going to do when he comes back and forth to the earth. And that is prophecy, what he's going to do. Verse 11, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yahweh. <laughs> is that all of the Word? Because all of that word then is his name. All of that word it became flesh and we call him Yehoshua, meaning what? Yahweh is deliverer. I, I don't think we've gotten there yet, but we get to it in Numbers, you know, where he took a young man by the name of Hosea, whose name means deliverer, and he changed this man's name from Hosea to what? Then we have Joshua, but he changed it to, to Yehoshua. 
Joshua is Yehoshua, and that was Hosea meaning deliverer, and then he said Yehoshua meaning Yahweh is deliverer. It's important to understand that distinction. I know that there's all kinds of, of studies and all kinds of readings and all kinds of doctrines out there on names and everything. I'm just choosing to believe what it says in the book of Numbers. Okay, I'm trying to, you know, a whole bunch of other things. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yahweh. If you change the Word, do you change his name? If you change the Word, then the one you're following is different from the one that this Word describes. The Word describes one who said that the law is forever. The Word describes one who didn't come to do away with the law. The question that you have to ask yourself is, who am I following, the one whose name matches this word, or if I'm following somebody else? And it's your choice. That's, that's what you have to, you know. Okay, go back and we'll get in, verse, in, in chapter 7. <clears throat> I know chapter 7 is kind of long. It's only got 89 verses. But a lot of us are saying the same thing over and over. <laughs> okay? Now, in verse 1 of, of, of uh, Bamidbar, chapter 7, completion, perfection. Now, it came to pass when Moshe had finished setting up the tabernacle that he anointed it and sanctified it and all its furnishings and the altar and all its utensils, so he anointed them and sanctified them. Go back to Leviticus chapter 8. In Leviticus chapter 8, in verses 10 and 11. In verse 10, it said, Then Moshe, I'm in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 10, Then Moshe took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and sanctified them. He sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar and all its utensils and the labor and its base to sanctify them. Now let's go back to number 7, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Moshe had finished setting up the tabernacle. All of a sudden, it seemed like it connects this chapter in the book of Numbers back with that chapter when it you know, was finished in Leviticus chapter 8. You see what I'm saying? I'm trying to help us get the idea of how these things work together and how they, they, they fit one with the other. We might think that everything happens exactly in chronological order, but if we really study the Scriptures carefully, we find that that's not necessarily true. The book of Revelation is not a chronological order, is it? Because chapter 12 in the book of Revelation just, you know, blows everything. Because that goes back to the beginning and comes all the way to the end and then takes you to another chapter. So, I mean, chronological order is something that man's thought about, not necessarily what Scripture really is. I just want you to see how chapter 7 fits perfectly right in between verse 10 and 11 there of Leviticus chapter 8. Now, going back and we'll read it again. <laughs> it came to pass when Moshe had finished setting up the tabernacle that he anointed it and sanctified it, all its furnishings and the altar and all its utensils. So he anointed them and sanctified them. And remember, sanctified and set them apart for Yahweh's use. If it's set apart for his use and somebody else uses it for something other than what it's sanctified for, is that not a desecration? Verse 2, Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of their fathers' houses, who were the leaders of the tribes and of those who were numbered, made an offering. And they brought their offering before Yahweh. Six covered carts, twelve oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders, and for each one an ox. And they presented them before the tabernacle. <clears throat> Then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Except from them that they may be used in doing the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall give them to the Levites, to every man, according to his service. So Moshe took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two carts and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service, and four carts and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service, under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Koath he gave none, because theirs was the service of the holy things they carried on their shoulders. Were they supposed to be carried any other way? 
So when King David went down there with his mighty men and everything, and they were going to bring the, the ark up, and he went down there and he got the ark and he put it on a cart, you know, a new cart, you know, and put them calves or them cows on it, drawing it. Was he doing what he was supposed to do? No. Motivation wasn't bad. He wanted to bring the, the thing up, right? People sometimes, all kinds of people have great motivation, but when their methods do not fall in line with the word of Yahweh, they can cause dire consequences. David's methods didn't line up with the word, and then they had this this thing on the on the cart, and when the oxen stumbled and somebody reaches up to steady it, what happened? He touched it and he died. Well, do you think Yahweh just decided to get mad and kill him? Or did his word say that if that happened, that would happen? The word brought itself to pass, right? David got very angry, it says. Now, when you read in that passage of Scripture, you know, David talks about all them thousands that he had with him. They might have got together and talked about it and said, you know, well, that old talk, you know, old Torah, that was for them days. We live in modern times. It really doesn't apply to us. <laughs> Isn't that what people say today? It doesn't really apply to us. You want to bet? Because you're betting your life on it. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? All I'm really trying to get across to people, this is not a game that we're talking about. This is the truth of the one that created us, and he became flesh and died for us so that we could have what he wanted for us in the first place. Not what we earned. It's what it's all about. It's not a game. It's not something you do every now and then. You know, it's 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, walking according to Torah. And Bible hope, remember. Bible hope is a white hot expectation that Yahweh's fixing to do what He promised because we're doing what He told us to do. It's an exciting way of living life. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that good stuff. <laughs> Preach to me. <coughs> In verse 10. <coughs> Now. now the leaders offered the dedication for the altar when it was anointed so the leaders offered their offering before the altar for Yahweh said to Moshe they shall offer their offering one leader each day for the dedication of the altar we have this reputation but then who set it up that they're going to do it one a day yeah. Yahweh set it up so there's got to be something that he wants us to learn from this repetition. It's not just boring repetitions and saying it over and over and over. If I read it, and of course those of you who have been in synagogues when they're reading this portion of Scripture, you know that all the rabbis and the cantors, when they get up there, they're trying to see who can outread the other. You know, see who can do it faster. You know. <clears throat> they shall offer their offering one liter each day for the dedication of the altar. <clears throat> In verse 12, And the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nachshon, the son of Aminadab, from the tribe of Judah. Just to give you an example, the word Nachshon is number 5177. The meaning of the word is the enchanter. It's also a word sometimes that's used to mean the serpent. Isn't that something? The serpent, the enchanter, right? Now, Scripture tells us, you know, that, that, that we're not supposed to be under Hasatan, right? In Revelation chapter 12, it calls the devil, that old serpent of old, you know? So all those things, the serpent that represents, you know, the evil one, it has a connection with sin. It was a serpent that enchanted or enticed Eve and, and Adam in the beginning, right? And we're going to see in Numbers, you know, when, when he went out there and, and, and uh, he sent the serpent. Remember, the people, all they did was complain and gripe and grumble and moan and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And Yahweh finally got sick of it. And he sent the serpent to bite them, right? And it was kind of like this copper serpent, you know. And, and, and the people, you know, got bit. But then he told Moses, he said, go out there and make an, an emblem of this snake, this serpent, and put it on a pole so that when the people go look at it, they can be healed. 
if the serpent is kind of a symbol of death through Hasatan, when well, somebody that is bitten by the death, then they can be what? They can be redeemed, they can be healed by looking upon this one that, that's on this pole, right? The serpent. Well, now Messiah was one that was actually hung on the execution stake, but he was made to be sin for us, wasn't he? When you look to see him, in Corinthians it tells us that when the Jewish people read the ancient contract, I know in our English Bible it has Old Testament, it makes it sound like it's done away with, but the actual Greek says ancient contract. When they read the ancient contract, it said the veil is still over their eyes and they can't see. But the minute they turn to Yahushua, then the veil comes off and they can see. Are they seeing Yehoshua or are they seeing Yehoshua in the Torah? You see the difference? When we begin to look and we see Yehoshua in the Torah and in all the prophets, then you know what? The veil has been lifted from our eyes and we can see the one who we call our deliverer. And yet, many people in those last days are going to you know, come up to him and, and he's going to say, what, well, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Anyway. <clears throat> so the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nachshon, the son of Aminadi from the tribe of Judah. <laughs> his offering was one silver platter, the weight of which was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering one gold pan of ten shekels full of incense one young bull, one ram and one male lamb in his first year as a burnt offering one kid of the goats as a sin offering and for the sacrifice of peace offerings two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs in their first year this was the offering of Nachshon the son of Aminadab and then on the second day, Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, the leader of Issachar, presented an offering. <clears throat> Nathaniel, the number is 5417. Nathaniel. Nathan means gift. El is referring to Elohim, so Nathaniel is the gift of Elohim, the gift of the Creator. When we're looking at all these things, the gift or given of El. It reminds me then you come back and, and, and those of you who haven't really done this or look up meanings of word, maybe this will just inspire you to do so. We have what we call four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew in Hebrew is a name Matatiyahu. Mark comes from Marcus, but it's still a Greek. <clears throat> Luke then would be, you know, the word, you know, uh, it's another Greek name. It's not really Hebrew. But then we have John, which is Yochanan. And the name Yochanan in the Hebrew means what? For Yahweh has been gracious. So we look at Matatiyahu, and it means what? The gift of Yah. And the implication of the gift of Yah is the Torah. Mark means, Marcus, it means a large hammer. Luke means light. L-I-G-H-T, light. <clears throat> Yoking on for Yahweh has been gracious. So you put the four Gospels together and you have the gift of Yahweh, the Torah, is a large hammer of light for Yahweh has been gracious. You think some man made it up? <laughs> How come the first four Gospels, only two of them, were two of the original disciples, Matthew and John? other two, Mark and Luke, they from somewhere else. We go back and we look also in, in, in the witnesses, right? You know that he sent to spy out the land, one from Judah and, and one from Ephraim. And of those two, you know, from Judah what was a, a, a man called, a, what? Caleb, wasn't he? Caleb was from Judah. And the other one was from Ephraim. And his name was Hosea, right? So you got Hosea and Caleb, the two spies who gave a good report, right? And of those, Caleb was the father of who? I mean, the son of Yephunah, who was what? A convert to Judaism. So out of the two witnesses, one of them was of Ephraim and the other one was a convert. You start to think about that, you know, that, 
back in 135, common area, in, in the Jewish tradition, we have Rabbi Akiva, who was what? The chief rabbi of Jerusalem, right? And his whole family were converts to Judaism. I'm just trying to, to say, okay, with this, sometimes what things appear to be on the surface is not necessarily what's true. And if any of you haven't read a book called The 13th Tribe, I would suggest you get it and read it, because that's a very interesting reading. I think it came back. It's on the shelf in there if anybody would like to read it. But I'm not going to go through each one of these things, because everything that each one gave, each one was exactly the same as the other. Right? <clears throat> but just to give you a thought, in uh, verse uh, 24, on the third day was Eliab, Numbers 446. El is talking about the Creator, right? And Ab is the Hebrew word for Father, correct? So Eliab means El is Father. <laughs> In verse 36, see how fast we're going to go through these 89 verses? <laughs> In verse 36, on the fifth day, Shalumiel, the son of Zuri Shaddai, leader of the children of Simeon. Shalumiel is the number 8017, and it means the friend of El. Verse 42, on the sixth day, Eliasaph, the son of Deuel, leader of the children of Gad. Eliasaph is the number 460, and it means El has added. Some of these definitions of these names you're not going to be able to find in Strong's or even in Brown Driver Big, but if you don't have it, there's another book out there. It's called Jones Dictionary or Encyclopedia of the Hebrew names, in, of the names of the cities, the people, and everything else that they've gone through and listed this whole thing. Uh -huh. You forgot to say 4, verse 30. Oh, I did, didn't I? Okay. So we back up to verse 30 then to get day four, or the fourth one. Yeah, on the fourth day, Elizur, the son of Shidur, the leader of the children of Reuben. And Elizur, or Elitzur, is the number 468. Remember, the word sur in Hebrew means rock. So Elizur, El, is a rock. I mean, when you begin to stop and think about all the things and the phrases and, and, and some of the things that come through the Psalms and the Proverbs and the phrases that are spoken in the New Testament writings and everything, you go back to what these names mean. And remember, it said that the entire gospel was preached to Abraham. Right? And if you stop and think about, you know, he being the father of multitudes. Okay. All right, now where was I? <laughs> where? Did I give you verse 42? Yes, sir. Eliasaph, 460 means El has added. Okay. And then in verse 48, on the seventh day, Elishama means Yahweh, or El has heard. 476, El has heard. In uh, verse 54, on the eighth day, Gamliel, or Gamaliel, but it's Gamliel, the number is 1583, and it means the reward of El. In verse 60, on the ninth day, Abidan, the son of Gideonai, leader of the children of Binyamin. And Abidan, the number is 27, and it means father is judge. Abidan. Verse 66, on the tenth day, Achizer, or Ahiezer, is what they, Ahiezer, number is 295. It means my brother is help. Is what? My brother is help. And in verse 72, on the 11th day, Pagiel, the son of Ochran, leader of the children of Asher, Number 6295, and it means the event, E-V-E-N-T, event of L. <laughs> In verse 78, on the twelfth day, 
Now, I don't know if somebody got this idea talk about the 12 days of, you know what, but all kinds of things get distorted, you know. And, but the gifts that they brought were all the same. Do we, do, do, do we notice that? Everything's the same. Verse 78, on the twelfth day, Achira. Achi is a Hebrew word for brother. Ra is a Hebrew word for evil. Achira, 299, my brother is evil. When you go back and you kind of put all these things together, the enchanter was given a bell. But El is the father, El is a rock. Friend of El, because El has added and El has heard, given the reward of El. The father is judge, but my brother is help. In the event of El, but my brother is evil. So, I mean, I don't know, I can't tell you that all that means in that. I'm just saying, when you put them together and you start looking at them, and you look at everything that's come down from the time of the serpent first enchanted or beguiled Chava evil. Now if we go on down here in, in verse 79 his offering was one silver platter the weight of which was 130 shekels one silver bowl of 70 shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering one gold pan of tin full of incense one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb as first year as a burnt offering. One kid of the goats as a sin offering, and as a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Ahira, the son of Enon. This was the dedication for the altar from the leaders of Israel when it was anointed. Twelve silver platters, twelve silver bowls, and twelve gold pans. Each silver platter weighed 130 shekels, and each bowl 70 shekels. All the silver of the vessels weighed 2,400 shekels according to the shekels of the sanctuary. The 12 gold pans full of incense weighed 10 apiece according to the shekels of the sanctuary. All the gold of the pans, 120. All the oxen for the burnt offering were 12 young bulls, the rams 12, the male lambs in their first year 12 with their grain offering, the kids of the goats as a sin offering 12. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of peace offerings were 24 bulls, the rams 60, the male goats 60, and the lambs in their first year 60. This was a dedication for the altar after it was anointed. Take all of them and multiply them times 12 and you got a bunch. <laughs> right? Because you got 12 people. If we go back and we look at what Solomon did when he dedicated the temple, right? And he provided all the things for the people and look at the numbers that he did. Okay? But that was, you know, he was feeding a whole lot more people than what we're talking about right here out in the, out in the wilderness in front of the tabernacle. But after all this, in verse 89. Now when Moshe went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with him, referring to Yahweh, he heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the lid that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. Thus he spoke to him. I said lid instead of mercy seat. Because the word is translated mercy seat the number is 3727. And it don't mean mercy seat. Never did. If you look up the word definition, the word itself is caporet. It only has one meaning. It means a lid. <laughs> caporet is where we get the same word to keep off, the covering from. That's, you know, that's what they wear, the keep off. Caporet. That's all it comes from. The Hebrew word is keep off. The Yiddish word is yarmulke. But caporet, it means a lid. So when you take the phrase mercy seat off of it, then you know that he was speaking it from above the lid of the ark. And you understand the lid was made out of what? Pure gold. And this lid had these two cherubim. And the Hebrew words actually say protruding out of the end and still one piece with it. So this lid with the two cherubim was all made out of one piece, cast and hammered. And the voice was where? Above. If we change this thing into a mercy seat, if we change it into being the throne that Yahweh sits on, then we can make out like this thing looks like a chair. 
And then we can have people go into all kinds of things and get sick and get viruses and get delirious and everything else and get vision and see this thing and come back and draw a picture. And now all of a sudden you've even got documented writings by people that said, oh yeah, it was a, it was like the Caribbean that had one wing down and, and one wing up and that formed a leg and one was the back so it's a chair people sit in. Where is that scripture? You go back and you look at the Hebrew word and it said lid. It don't say nothing about a mercy seat. What was the lid for? The lid was the covering on top of the ark. And remember the word ark only has two meanings. Box or coffin. <laughs> That's all it means. And it's the symbol of one. The tablets were in a box. The one that those tablets represented was put in a, in a coffin, so to speak. The covering is solid gold. It's pure gold, right? Gold is the medal of divinity. Silver is the medal of redemption. Copper is the medal of ransom or judgment. There is no such thing as brass or bronze in Scripture. In the Hebrew, it's always copper, which is a pure metal. Brass or bronze is an alloy made by man. Yahweh doesn't deal in alloys. He deals in purity. Silver, the pure, pure metal of redemption, you know. If you go back and just make yourself a note, read the book of Song of Solomon. And you read the Apurion, the chair that he made for the bride to ride in. And if you look at all the real meanings of what the words are, then you'll find that the chair that the bride rides in is based on obedience. Okay, And it says it's paved with what? Love. In 1 John, what's the definition of love? Obedience to the word of Yahweh. That's what's paved in this superior, the one that carries the bride. I'm just trying to get people to begin to look at what really the words really mean and what the scripture is trying to tell us, and then we can get the real picture of what Yahweh is trying to say. We have to get rid of what we've been taught. We have to get rid of false doctrines that we've been, you know, bombarded with for many, many days. I'm not trying to present a new doctrine or anything to you. I'm just a new idea. Believe what the word says. Because most people really don't. They think they do. But if you don't know for sure what it says, there's no way you can believe it. Okay? <clears throat> Why is there so much repetition in this thing? Why? Do, I mean, we didn't read it all, but why is there so much repetition of the things that were given? Everything, you know, say it again. Everything said again. Everything said again. The one unifying factor in all these verses is unity. I, I sang a song a while ago, you know, he named my toe. How beautiful it is when brethren, you know, live together in the Word, or work together, or come together, or united in what the Word says. Without unity, then there really is no semblance of what being with Yahweh. So why so much repetition? It's the unity of the faith or trusting in His Word. In order for us to trust the Word the same, we all have to know what the Word says. And we've got to understand the same understanding of what the Word says. Not what I think somebody said, but what the definition really is. Go to Deuteronomy 31. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, in verse 16, And Yahweh said to Moshe, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. Actually, in the Hebrew it says, You shall die and join your ancestors. That's what... You shall die and join your ancestors, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Is that not a statement of what's going to be? That's not even a prophecy. That's a statement of what's going to happen after him, right? Isn't that what he said? And then look down at verse 29. Moses is speaking and he says, For I know <laughs> that after my death you will become utterly corrupt. How did he know that? Yahweh just told him. I mean, it, we don't ever really stop and think about it. Moshe didn't say or do anything except what Yahweh said. And I'm not trying to be facetious or play on cliches, but if you don't have a 
Thus saith Yahweh, for what you do, then who said do it? And if he said do it, and he said this word is forever, then who said it's over? You know, I've actually heard preachers sometimes talking about it, and they say whenever you see the word forever used in Scripture, it really means temporary. Can you imagine somebody saying that? That was on the radio. <laughs> you know, you nearly break your finger trying to hit the button. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now go to Luke 16. Uh, in Luke 16, verses 29 uh, through 31. This whole, these last three verses are, are actually, it starts back in 19, it's the parable of the rich man and Elijah, but in verse 29 it says, Abraham said to him, they have Moshe and the prophets, let them hear them. Moshe and the prophets. I don't know whether y'all realize that, but Messiah thought Moshe wrote the Torah. I know there's a lot of scholars at the Baptist Seminary and other places that said he didn't really write it, Moses didn't, it was written by somebody called Jay, and they were really a woman. All I got news, Messiah thought Moses wrote it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Who's telling this story? Jehoshua. He knows he's going to rise from the dead. And he's saying that even though I rise from the dead, people are not going to believe me. And why? And you know what it is? People today, they go, they carry their Bibles, they go into places where the people are teaching and everything, you know, and they read and then they listen and it don't match and they say, oh, well, he got the degree. He must know what he's talking about. I'm just too dumb. I can't believe it. Have you ever heard somebody say to me, I, I just can't understand the Bible. I read it, but I just can't understand it. It's not hard to understand a child can understand it. A child can memorize it. A child can recite it. They may not have full understanding, but they can read it and, and, and you know. Then we come along and tell them, well, I know that's what it said, but that ain't what it means. Have we heard that? <clears throat> if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though run and rise from the dead. <clears throat> Ah, we're on the downhill leg now, right? <laughs> Most people today don't believe the prophets. They don't believe Moses because they don't read them. Why should they? After all, they've been taught for so many times. All that old law stuff done away with. We don't have to worry about that stuff. We're living under the new covenant. We talked about that earlier. New covenant, new disposition, right, of sin. Well, if we got all this new stuff, I want to know what the new disposition or the new definition of sin is. What is it? I told somebody one time, you know, well, you know, if we don't have no law to keep, then we don't have no law that we can break. So if we don't have any laws to break, then I can't sin. And if I can't sin now, and I've been born since Messiah was here, what do I need salvation for? What's the purpose? I mean, you know, I'm going to join all them others in heaven anyway. Don't make no difference what I do, does it? But in that that's stupid thought, we know that, right? <laughs> but at the same time, if you go along with what they say, then it makes perfect sense. If there is no law, what are we going to do? If the law could be changed, all Yahweh had to do was change it just a little bit or change the definition of sin, and He wouldn't have had to become flesh and die for us. It can't change. It can't go away. It is forever. That's why He had to do it what he said. Go to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5 in verses 45 through 47. Messiah again is speaking. He said, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father, there is who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. 
Look at there, Messiah didn't think that Moses was going to be done away with. He said, Moses is the one going to accuse you. I'm not accusing you. He didn't come to accuse. He came to save it, didn't he? Or deliver us from, our, from everything. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is who accuses you, Moshe, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moshe, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You know why most people don't believe Messiah? They don't have any idea what Moses said. They read Matthew 5, 17, and he said, Don't even think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not. He came to fulfill it. And then they say, Oh, well, he came and fulfilled it. I had a man tell me one time, he said, I can't show you this in Scripture, but I just believe that, 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 that he came and did everything so I don't have to. So he came and fulfilled a part that said, don't murder somebody so you can. Is that what you're telling me? Isn't that what it says? I mean, when they, when they make that statement? Messiah didn't need any pork chops, so we can. Is that it? He fulfilled the law completely, didn't he? If he meant he did everything it said, and since he did it, then we don't have to. And then the man said, but I can't show that to you in Scripture. I guess not. <laughs> but I mean, where, you know, when do these people begin to stop, you know, thinking, you know, I mean, start thinking, I guess. <laughs> okay. In John 5, <clears throat> again, in for example, if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? We must study the Torah. We must study the words that Yahweh sent through Moshe in order to understand what Messiah Yehoshua was talking about. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. If you don't what? If you don't believe, you can't believe mine. All we have today is people not knowing what Moses said and distorting them what Messiah said. <clears throat> okay. That concludes the readings for this day in the Torah. And now if you will go with me to the book of Judges and we're gonna get a couple little things here. In the book of Judges, chapter thirteen, Shoftim. You know, it's really kind of interesting when you look at the seven first books in the Bible. You got the Torah for five, and then you got Joshua, Yehoshua, and then Judges, right? Mm -hmm. So you got the five books of the Torah, kind of like grace, and then Messiah came, Yehoshua, grace upon top of grace, and then He brought judgment on sin. Isn't that neat? Mm -hmm. Judges chapter thirteen. I can't find judges. There it is. <clears throat> now again, this is the story of, of the, the conception and birth of Shimshon, or Samson, and because he was a Nazarite, and that was a connection between, you know, the Torah and the half-Torah portion. And in verse 2 he says, Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. The name Manoah is the number 4494, Manoah. Actually, it's Manoah, is what it is in the Hebrew. And it means rest. Kind of like the name Noah means rest. You know, the one that built the ark. And brought all them people on the ark, you know, and made it through the... <coughs> when the wrath was being just, you know, on the earth by the water, you know. Kind of picture of the word bringing the wrath. And then Manoah, you know, in the ark, you know, and Yahweh was the one that took him in there and then closed the door. Didn't let him out until he opened the door. <clears throat> A certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was buried, had no children. And the angel, remember the word angel is the word melek from Hebrew, which means a messenger. And we get this word angel, which comes from Christian thought, and we always, you know, put wings on it of some kind, you know, make this angel thing. But actually it means a messenger of Yahweh appeared to the woman and said to her, the messenger of Yahweh. In Malachi, it says, who is the messenger of Yahweh? Yehoshua. He is the messenger of what? The new covenant, the new disposition. Who came to install or instigate the new disposition, Messiah did? Well, then who was it that was appearing to the book of Judges and appearing to Moshe and appearing to all these people? And we read it says the angel of Yahweh must have been the messenger of Yahweh who was what? Yehoshua. 
in the book of Jehoshua, Joshua, when they were fixing to go in the promised land, and Joshua looked up and he saw this man standing there, you know, with a sword and everything, and he went over there and he had his sword. He said, Are you for us or against us? My paraphrase. And he said, No, but I have come as what? As the captain of the army of Yahweh. Take off your shoes for where you stand in holy ground. Who is that standing there with a sword in his hand? The messenger of Yahweh, Yehoshua. Okay. I mean, we begin to understand the Melech, the messenger. And when we see angel in there, our mind runs with something, you know. Okay. The angel of Yahweh appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are buried and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. This is a messenger that's appeared there. I'm going to show you how it's really clear and who this was. Verse 4, Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or drink and not to eat any unclean. Now that's similar to, again, strong drink. And not to eat any unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to El from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Palestinian Philistines. The word Philistines there is actually in the Hebrew is the word what? Palestine. P E L E S T I N E, which, which is what? It was then what? <clears throat> Converted by the Romans in 70 AD and became Palestine, and then that was the name that they put on the land of Israel when they kicked all the Jews out of it. And it's been known as Palestine ever since. <clears throat> now, this uh, child was supposed to be a Nazarite. Dedicated to Yahweh from birth. Verse 6, So the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of El came to me. She said it was a man of El. Came to me, and his countenance or his appearance was like the countenance of the messenger of El. Very awesome, but I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or strong drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to El from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to Yahweh and said, I think most Bibles have the English words in there, Oh my Lord. The Hebrew actually says Yahweh. He just said, Yahweh, please let the man of Elohim whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. And Elohim listened to the voice of Manoah. And the messenger of Elohim came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband, said to him, Look, the man had just now appeared to me, the one who came to me the other day. She said, The man came back. Same one. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? He said, Ani. Man, a few words, right? And Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So the messenger of Yahweh said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or strong drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Then Manoah said to the angel, Armelech, of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh. Please let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel or the messenger or the melech of Yahweh said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to Yahweh. For Manoah did not know he was the melech, messenger of Yahweh. He did not know. Now he's telling there, if you offer a burnt offering. And the word burnt offering in the Hebrew means what? To come near to, or to go up with, and go near to and go up. Then Manoah said to the messenger of Yahweh, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the messenger of Yahweh said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it's wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to Yahweh and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar it happened that the messenger of Yahweh 
ascended, went up in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw, they fell on their faces to the ground. Don't you realize this would be something? I mean, here is a fire that goes up from this food on the on the rock, right? And then this man standing there steps up in that into that flame and just goes up in the flame. Don't you think that'd be a little bit exciting to see? <laughs> It'd make you kind of nervous, would it? He got nervous. Verse 21, When the messenger of Yahweh appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel or the messenger, the Melech of Yahweh. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen Elohim. He knew who they was. Elohim referred to the Creator. We've just seen the one who created everything. Now, who created everything? Yahushua did. That's what it says in John, right? He created everything in the beginning. In the, But in Genesis 1 1, what does it say? Bereshi. In the beginning. But that word Bereshi also means what? In the firstborn. Yahweh created everything. Then Manoah knew that he was the messenger of Yahweh. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen Elohim. Then his wife said to him, If Yahweh had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a great offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. Talking about who had the most sense, she knew who he was. So she said, you silly thing, <laughs> you're going to destroy us if you don't do all this. He didn't come to destroy, but to what? To bless, to bring to pass. All the blessing comes from Yahweh's word. So the woman bore his son and called his name, we read Samson, <laughs> the number is 8123. It's the Hebrew word shimshon, S H I M shon, shimshon, which means what? Sunlight. Sunlight. The woman bore a son and called his name Shimshon, and the child grew, and Yahweh blessed him. Verse 25 And the Spirit of Yahweh began to move upon him at Mahanedan the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. <clears throat> the word Zorah, the number 6881. The word itself means hornet. Like a hornet. And then Eshtaol is the number 847 and it means entreaty or to entreat someone, you know, to, to, to try to, to, to get a, a deal with them, to entreat. So it was between the hornet and the entreaty is where he began what? To judge Israel. And he began to judge and he came what? Against the Philistines. Began to destroy them. In the, I'd like to read just a statement from the Pentateuch. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Pentateuch, but this is a, a, it's a, some writings by Orthodox Jewish people. They don't accept Messiah Yehoshua by any means, but some of their understanding going back, you know, kind of gives us some pretty good insights. And it's talking about Samson. It says, Samson lived in the days of the judges, a dark age in Bible history when there was no king in Israel, and each one did that which was right in his own eyes. The book of Judges covers a long period of time, and I think there's two or three places in there that says there was no king in Israel at that time, and each man did what was right in his own eyes. If there's no king in your life, then you do what's right in your own eyes. Right? And if there's no king in your life, then you have just become your own king. When we reject what the Messiah has done for us in removal of sin and to give us eternal life, then we have chosen to become our own sacrifice for what we've done. And when that happens, there is no eternal life. Now the people had been in bondage for over 40 years to the Philistines, the most powerful and best organized of Israel's foes in the struggle for the possession of Canaan. The Philistines were the one that the land belonged to, and Yahweh said, I'm going to bring you in, and you're going to use them to destroy the Philistines, but they never did get rid of them, did they? Scripture says if you don't wipe them out, they're going to be thorns in your side and pricks in your eyes. Can you say that? What's bugging them today? <laughs> the descendants of all those people, okay? Unlike the Midianites and the Moabites who merely came to plunder, you know, they come in and attack and they just, you know, came to plunder, the Philistines conquered in order to rule over. They disarmed the Israelites and reduced them to a condition of abject submission. 
go back and look at the story, you know, where it talked about King Saul and his son Jonathan, you know, and they were out there and they were, you know, the, the Jewish people didn't even have any soldiers, swords or nothing. So they had to go try to make some to try to, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Anyway, Shemshon or Samson, whose birth is foretold and announced in this Haftor, brought a temporary deliverance from the Philistine yoke. But he was utterly alone, and he wrought his intermittent feats of private revenge and daring alone, supported neither by enthusiasm for the national cause nor by active help from his people. He was a man strong physically but weak morally who suffered, who suffered shipwreck through following the desires of the eyes. It's all the women. In the book of Hebrews it says that we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. He walked by sight, by what he saw. And he wanted what he saw. <clears throat> Later on, he was captured. You know, all the stuff he went through. He was blinded by his enemies. Then he buried his enemies and himself in the ruins of the idolatrous temple in which the Philistines had gathered to feast over his miseries. The sight of the eyes, it's a pretty good picture of something that he, he was called to do the work of Yahweh. He's supposed to be a Nazarite from birth. And then he let these other things get in his eyes. They must through this woman, you know. I think they call her Delilah. But somehow he lost everything. And then, you know, when his hair grew back, he didn't realize his strength was going back. We all know the story. But the thing about it is, it was his love of what he saw. He was guided by his eyes. Okay? Instead of what the Word said to him. This was in the book of Judges. <clears throat> did uh, Torah exist at that time? It had been given to Moses, didn't it? Many years earlier. So it was there, and there's no excuse for him to not know. We can use the excuse, well, we weren't brought up in Torah. <laughs> but you had one laying on a coffee table. You know, most people think when you mention the word Torah, it's an entirely different book that they read. You know, the Jews read instead of what they read. They don't read it. Genesis through Deuteronomy, it's the same thing. Go with me to Acts chapter 25. <clears throat> Y'all being so good today, I... In Acts chapter 25, So now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Yehudi informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Caesarea. It's on the coast, you know, the Mediterranean. And there's two Caesareas in Israel. One's called Caesarea Maritime, which is there on the coast just north of Joppa, which is just north of Tel Aviv. And the other one is Caesarea Philippi, which is up in the north in the area tribe of Dan towards the headwaters of the Jordan River. <coughs> this is Caesarea Maritime there on the coast of the Mediterranean. Verse 5, Therefore he said, Let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. And when he had remained among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Yehudi who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, Neither against the law of the Yehudi, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. But Festus, wanting to do the Yehudi a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Wishing to do the Yehudi a favor? What he's saying is, why don't you go on down there with me, and then you know, I'm going to bring you up before them, and then they're the one trying to kill him anyway. And he said, I can do them a favor, and why not getting Paul killed and everything too? Paul no dummy. He knew what was going on. Then Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Yehudi I have done no wrong as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. 
Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Do you have appeal to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Yehudi informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such thing as I suspected or supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion, about one Yehoshua who had died, whom Paul affirmed was still alive, or to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, and see, Augustus was Caesar. Remember, Caesar is just a title. So Augustus was Caesar at this time. I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp pageantry, I mean, people trying to be something big and uptight, something that they really ain't been going on a long time. <laughs> and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city. At Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Yehudi petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. You know, he didn't say anything about any kind of a law that said this or that. It just seemed unreasonable to him. They could do anything they wanted to do. They had the power to kill you. If they felt like doing it, they just did it. I mean, who's, who's going to stop them? Rome was one of the most corrupt governments that ever existed. Right? Chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I thank myself, happy King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Yehudi especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Yehudi. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, <clears throat> all the Yehudi know, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by Elohim to our fathers. Hear carefully what he's saying. All he's doing is, you know, because of the promise that was made, right? To this, our twelve tribes, earnestly serving Elohim night and day, hope to attain. They're busting their bun trying to do the law because they think that they're going to be able to get something for it, and yet all of that was to teach them about Messiah Yahushua, whom they missed. He himself, he said, he himself, Messiah said, if you had known the Father, you'd know me. But they didn't know him. And yet when he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, what, thousands went out and laid down the branches and everything else before him. They knew who he was. Who actually rejected him then? Leadership. Who's the one that gives us the most problem today? Leadership. <laughs> it's not, you know, people who care. And it's not the world out there. They don't really give a flip who you worship. You know, just leave them alone, right? They don't care. To this, our twelve tribes earnestly serving Yahweh night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Yehudi. Why should it be thought incredible by you that Elohim raises the dead? 
Stop and think about it. By this time, don't we already have all the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Kings and Chronicles and all this kind of stuff? We got all them prophets doing all them kind of things. See me like one called Elisha or Elisha. You know, he wanted a double portion of everything, you know, that Elijah had. Elijah had what? You know, 21 miracles that he did. Elisha, you know, he did all them others, but then he died. Remember, he was sick of the disease that he was going to die from, but he'd only had, what, like 41 miracles. And then what was number 42? Remember the soldier that got killed in the battle? They didn't have time to bury him, so they put him in the tomb, and he fell down on the bones of Elisha, and guess what? He came alive. <laughs> Boy, I mean, it's one of those things. You know, Elisha was sick in the bed of the disease, you know, that he couldn't stop himself from dying from, but yet the power and the bones of his body brought another man alive. I can't explain that. But the scripture said it happened, so I believe it. But they said, you know, why should it be thought incredible by you that Yahweh raises the dead? He talks about it in a lot of other places. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Yehoshua of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted even to foreign cities. While thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all, and when we all had fallen to the ground, have you all ever heard anybody talk about when, when, when uh, Paul got knocked off his horse and fell on the ground? <laughs> you ever heard say it? Have heard that said? Mm -hmm. Nowhere in Scripture does it say about him being on the horse. He just said when he fell to the ground. Didn't it? When we all had fallen to the ground, I heard the voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language. Isn't this funny? He spoke in the Hebrew. We got it in the English, copied from a Greek text that was probably copied from Hebrew somewhere. And you may have noticed those times, but he spoke Hebrew. So if what he's trying to give us then in these red letters is really the word of what he spoke to him, you know, chances are he was speaking in the Hebrew. <clears throat> and he's saying in the Hebrew language, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, who are you, master, or whatever he said, Adonai? And he said, I am Yehoshua, whom you are persecuting. See, he was persecuting the people, right? And yet Yahweh says, if you do it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. You know, sometimes when we talk about people, it, 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 when we talk about somebody, yesterday they were the meanest so and so, and they, you know, but last night they could have changed, and now they're not who they used to be. And then what we say can now be blasphemy against that person, right? So you're better off not to talk about people in any way, because anything can happen in the moment. I am Yehoshua, whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Some of the things that he's going to reveal to Paul, he didn't even know about yet. But he was willing to do it, regardless of what it was. Same as Abraham. He said, go out. And then I'll show you. And it says he went out, not even knowing where he was going. All he knew was he was following the word of Yahweh. Today, whenever we get that thing, we say, well, well where are we going to go? Well, what are we going to do? Or you know the people that say, oh, yeah, send me Yahweh. I'll go anywhere you want to say, I'll send you. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a word and send me. So, well, I want you, you know, he said, I'll go to Africa. He said, well, I want you to go across the street. He said, I ain't going over there. That guy's crazy. We're always willing to do things as long as it fits with what we really want to do, right? <laughs> Are we always willing to do what He wants us to do regardless of how hard or, or, or what the task is? Verse 17, He says, I will deliver you or rescue you from the Yehudi is implied as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of the adversary to Yahweh, our Elohim, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified or set apart by faith or trusting in me. When you look up faith in the dictionary, the very first <coughs> definition of the word faith is trust. 
You can't trust somebody if you don't know what they said. You've got to know what they said in order to trust them. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and to the Gentile that they should repent, turn to Elohim and do works befitting repentance. Everybody's supposed to repent, turn back in obedience to Yahweh's word and do works that are worthy of repentance. Greek, Jew, it don't make no never mind who. Everybody's supposed to do the same thing. We're supposed to repent and turn back in obedience to his will, which is his word, which is Torah. Is that not true? Verse 21, For these reasons the Yehudi seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from Elohim, to this day I stand witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. What did he say he was saying? No other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, and yet Christianity uses Paul and what he said as the basis for their religion. Is that not true? But Paul said, when I went Paul said he didn't say anything about other than what the prophet said. And Moses. Verse 23, that the Mashiach would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim life to the Yehudi, the people, and to the Gentiles. You know, when Paul saying this, there was no such thing as New Testament. You know, from the time that Messiah came, Going back to, to uh, uh, Malachi, you got about, what, about 400 years in there, you know, there was nothing, you know, written. And then you got a couple of hundred years after Messiah before we have the New Testament published, so you got about 600 years in there, right? How did people get saved or delivered? Believing in the Torah, believing in the Messiah who's going to come, what to, 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 that's what they were looking forward to, right? But if the Yehudi were being taught, oh, you just do a we, you know, in the priesthood, what we tell you, you'll be all right. Kind of like Jeroboam, didn't it? Didn't Jeroboam, you know, he went out and created his own faith, built his own temple, set up his own <coughs> feast day, set up his own priesthood. Sounds a lot like Catholic Church. Create their own festivals, create their own priesthood, create all everything, you know. It's all the same thing. You know, I, I guess you all have read the story about Jeroboam. You know, it's time to bury Jerry, right? <clears throat> verse 24 he says now as he thus made his defense Festus said with a loud voice Paul you're beside yourself much learning is driving you mad <laughs> you reckon he was getting excited but he said I'm not mad or out of my mind most noble Festus but speak the words of truth and reason for the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things for I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. He spoke to a king, didn't he? Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a, not Christian, but a follower of this Mashiach, is what he's saying. And Paul said, I would to Elohim that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing worthy of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But that was the whole thing. Yahweh said that he was going to have to what witness before kings and everything for him. We're going to shut it down right there, and we'll do 27 and 28 book of Acts next.